Ethical Mindfulness, written by Dave Smith, narrated by Graham Dunlop, edited by Darren Grimes. Introduction. Since the day I first learned that I could bring my attention out of my thinking mind and into my breathing body, my life has never been the same. Previously, I had no idea I could find freedom from the world of my own thoughts and the emotions they produced. Hearing the core teachings of Buddhism gave me an immediate and transformative shift in how I viewed what it means to be alive. The radical notion that everything I needed was inside of me? I had the power to free myself from suffering? I was in, and I yearned to learn more. Twenty years has passed since I first encountered mindfulness in Buddhism, and I've had varying degrees of success both as a mindfulness practitioner and as a Buddhist. Many times I've found myself in the middle of a paradox between gratitude and disappointment, being tremendously grateful for the tools and practices I was taught, while at the same time disappointed for the amount of work I had to do in order to feel some degree of contentment within my life. As a recovering addict and a survivor of complex trauma, I've lived most of my life with symptoms of PTSD, ADD, hypervigilance, and many unconscious denial strategies that come with trauma and addiction. Like many of us, I've suffered a lot. At the age of 11, my older sister was killed in a car accident on the way to school. Nobody ever really talked to me about that. When I was 19, My girlfriend and I were walking together when we were hit by a drunk driver. She was killed on impact, leaving me behind to discover the body. While living in Amsterdam at 28, I found myself strung out on alcohol and other drugs, sex and prostitution. I had fulfilled my life's dream of rock and roll stardom only to witness it all come crashing down. Heartbroken and disappointed, I headed back home to live at my mom and dad's. After five successful years of diligently working the 12 steps, I had built a home, a business, and married a girl who was also in recovery. I found myself living the good life that we hear about in recovery rooms. After relocating to Nashville, Tennessee, my wife relapsed, told me she didn't love me anymore, and moved out. I was devastated. Five years later, she was murdered. The case is still unsolved. During that time, I turned to mindfulness practice with a vengeance. I also found refuge and safety within 12-step communities. I've spent the last six years working with youth and adults in addiction treatment and prison system environments. I began teaching mindfulness tools that I learned and shared my experience with those who were open to a message of possibilities and inner freedom. Mindfulness meditation has saved my life on more than one occasion. Nevertheless, mindfulness practice alone has been unable to heal the entirety of my suffering. As I have been able to find a degree of ease and contentment within my own mind, my heart continues to ache. The development of ethics and heart practice meditations have become the fertile ground in which my heart is healing. Buddhism provides detailed instructions for a way of life that supports ethics and mindfulness. It has taught me how to respond to the ups and downs of life without creating unnecessary suffering and helped me meet the ongoing demands of the human experience with kindness, empathy, and discernment. I've dedicated my life's energy to the Buddhist path and I'm happy to report that I am learning to live well and find true happiness in the simplest of things. My intention with this ebook is to help you to be able to do the same thing. The strategies for this transformation are threefold, using the core teachings of Buddhism as a map to understand the nature of the territory we all must navigate, developing mindfulness as the vehicle for training and understanding the mind, and learning to access and liberate our hearts through the cultivation of ethics. The practice of ethical mindfulness is available to all who are interested and it doesn't require you to believe or accept anything on blind faith. The ideas, tools, and practices found here belong to all who are searching for true happiness and well-being. 
Toward this process, I offer definitions of our two key concepts. Ethical, the development and maintenance of intentions that hold non-harming of self and others as a core foundational value. Mindfulness, the ability to objectively monitor the arising and passing of thoughts, emotions, and sensations within the framework of present-time awareness. Chapter 1 A Brief Overview of Mindfulness and Its Mythology There is no limit to what can be said about the practice, theory, and applications of mindfulness. New areas of science, such as the field of contemplative neuroscience, are emerging to study the effects of mindfulness and meditation on the human brain. Buddhist scholars continue to put out new theories and papers about how the mind was understood and practiced by the Buddha and his immediate followers 2,500 years ago. Despite the increasing diversity of views, beliefs, and opinions among different mindfulness communities, one thing remains clear. Mindfulness has positive mental and emotional consequences for those who practice it. The term mindfulness has made its way into our everyday vernacular. The number of articles in both popular and scholarly publications on the benefits of mindfulness practice is vast and growing. A quick online search will bring up an overwhelming number of pages. In most cases, mindfulness seems to simply mean to pay attention. But could it be that there is a shadow side to all of the enthusiasm connected to this trend? Perhaps it is the fact that we don't see or hear much about the challenges that people face in their efforts to gain access to the sometimes daunting experience called mindfulness. As a teacher, I can't tell you how many times somebody walks into a mindfulness class for the first time after reading a few online articles and sits down expecting total bliss, a quiet mind, and immediate acceptance of things as they are. What they usually experience is inner chatter, criticism, doubt, reactivity, and the onset of challenging emotions. As a result, individuals often assume that they are doing it wrong, that it's not working, and or does not work at all. The reality is many people won't stay with mindfulness practice when they become hindered by frustration and doubt. What I typically see when someone comes into my class for the first time is a lot of unmanaged stress. He or she often attends the weekly class for a few weeks or maybe a few months. After the initial hit of relief wears off, it's common that the new person will begin to experience some of the underlying causes of their stress, anxiety, or depression, and he or she is out the door. In many cases, he or she will resurface six months or maybe a year later and repeat the same cycle. It occurs over and over. The question is, why does this happen so frequently? My belief is that it is ultimately the lack of self-regulation. This is a twofold problem. Number one, people are not able to allow, hold, or tolerate the effect they experience at the onset of difficult emotions. Number two, and if they can briefly access the emotion, They lack the ability to respond to the emotion in a skillful manner, or, as I will suggest, and discuss in detail later, an ethical manner. In brief, the person may experience an emotion as being unsafe or even harmful, which typically resonates as a feeling of hurt, loss, or sadness. When an emotion is viewed as harmful, the common reaction is aversion, anger, and even hatred toward that emotion. This is a state of emotional reactivity, and an example of being emotionally dysregulated. Unfortunately, reacting in this way is not an easy habit to overcome. It takes time, practice, patience, and in many cases, some additional therapeutic process. This is often the case if the individual has a personal history of trauma and or symptoms of PTSD. In the U.S., we are a culture of immediate gratification. We don't like to wait. And our get-it-now, drive-through, total access, priority status, hurry-up mentality is unlikely to decline anytime soon. 
As we cling to comfort and convenience, we only exacerbate the lack of tolerance we have for unpleasantness in all of its magnificent forms. This is a common paradox of the modern world. The ways in which why we can benefit from mindfulness shine a light on all the ways in which we might prefer to be mindless. The following are six of the most basic truths about mindfulness that people commonly are either unaware of or misunderstand. Number one, mindfulness is not easy. This is perhaps the biggest and most widespread misunderstanding about the cultivation of mindfulness. The practice of mindfulness is anything but easy. The learning curve is steep and counterintuitive. The instructions may be simple, but the application of them not so much. It's a great example of a skill that can take minutes to learn and a lifetime to master. In these busy times of overscheduling, 60-hour work weeks, economic insecurity, one global crisis after another, smartphones, substance abuse, and rampant sensory overstimulation, being able to simply find the time to sit down and even attempt to practice mindfulness meditation is quite difficult for many people. I recently read somewhere that the average American takes in more information in one day than a person in the 1700s would take in during an entire year. In this attention deficit disordered world, more and more young people are diagnosed with ADD and ADHD. We seem to have a psychiatric disorder for just about every unpleasant mental state. We consume distraction. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. We are constantly being marketed new and entertaining strategies and devices for distraction. We're addicted to it. As the external world continues to demand so much of our attention, it is no surprise that we find our inner life to be a bit empty. We experience disconnection while believing that we are so connected. Another paradox of the modern era. It is only when people recognize they are burned out on distraction and external overstimulation that they begin to consider that there may be an alternative. In fact, the reality is that our inner world may truly be the final frontier. Strung out and dissatisfied by the inability to find lasting happiness in external things. We may find ourselves sitting quietly with our eyes closed, attempting to bring our attention to the experience of breathing. We come into contact with the direct experience of life as it is, each moment rising and passing away before our very eyes. One mind moment flows into the next. We might find that we become bored and anxious, wondering if we are doing it correctly. We notice we don't feel calm or at ease. The body aches and is full of unpleasant sensations. We are too hot or too cold, too sleepy or too restless. We are waiting for something to happen, or we are waiting for something to go away. We are trying to be mindful, but we don't know what to be mindful of. We attempt to focus on our breathing, but it seems boring or too difficult to stay with. We start thinking. We become confused and doubt sets in. We think there is probably something more important to do, so we get up and think, so what's in the fridge? And we're gone again. We tend to chase distractions in the form of the next hit of what we think will feel good. That's easy, and we like easy. In contrast, mindfulness is hard work. Number two, mindfulness is not about trying to quiet the mind. As our mindfulness practice develops, we may find that at times, The mind may appear to be quieter and calmer, or we may not. If we believe that the aim of mindfulness is to quiet the mind, and we find that we are unable to do so, we will lose a valuable opportunity. This opportunity is to learn how to hold the experience of a loud or restless mind without getting caught up in reacting to it. As we develop mindfulness skills, we learn that we need to develop some degree of concentration. This does not mean that we need to establish 100% focus or some form of lockdown attention. We may just need to set up conditions that will allow the mind to settle and have a sense of being at ease. Often the term concentration can be misleading because many of us have been told, or have noticed, that we struggle with it. I prefer the term collected. We may just need to find a way to be present with 70% 
with what is arising, in other words, mostly present. We may want to consider that during meditation we are not trying to shut or tune the world out, but rather to let it all in. We will want to view meditation as the act of receiving rather than attempting to control. Attempting to control just gives rise to reactivity. We need to establish what is called simple awareness, the ability to simply be with things as they are. If we are fighting with the contents of the mind by trying to force it into a state of silence, we will become frustrated. Instead of getting caught up in aversion and reactivity toward the mind, we simply ignore it. We are not concerned with its energy or content. This approach will allow the mind to be loud, without concerns or attitudes about it. We ignore it and we allow it. We can learn to have an objective view toward the loudness and not become identified with it. We relate to the mind, not from the mind. If we approach practice with the attitude or misunderstanding that a quiet mind is a prerequisite to mindfulness, we are setting ourselves up for disappointment and failure even before we begin. Number three, mindfulness is not about feeling good all the time. To the contrary, the role of mindfulness is to help us see beyond the entire feel-good system. At the very core of mindfulness practice is the ability to see and ultimately be able to live beyond the human survival system that is dedicated by the pleasure-pain dichotomy, reaching for pleasure and pushing away pain. The ability to tolerate discomfort is a learned skill. Also, we need to face the fact that feeling good all the time is completely unrealistic. Establishing mindfulness of present-time awareness does not guarantee pleasant-time awareness. You may find that you have a headache, or maybe you had a difficult argument with a friend. Maybe a loved one is having a medical crisis, or somebody you know has just died. We wouldn't expect to have pleasant feelings about these experiences, would we? Sometimes mindfulness is equated to the idea that we are at ease with life just as it is. The ability to find contentment that we are talking about here should not imply that we always feel good. Practicing mindfulness may help us learn to meet and to hold our experience with openness and empathy. This is especially helpful when we are experiencing emotional or physical pain. It may help us put aside our common instincts around aversion and avoidance toward what is unpleasant, but certainly doesn't guarantee that those experiences will magically vanish. This is why the role of ethics is so crucial. As we begin to develop the ability to access our mental, emotional, and physical pains and limitations, we begin to meet those experiences with kindness and friendliness. We may find that we can. Be kind even when we don't feel good. This also helps to undermine our attachment to and need for things to be pleasant. It creates a deeper sense of ease with the transient nature of life as it is. Number four, mindfulness will not solve all your problems or those of others. The more I read, study, and discuss mindfulness with my friends and colleagues in the mental health field, there seems to be At the core of people's misunderstanding, a delusion that mindfulness alone may be some type of silver bullet that will put an end to all of life's difficulties. As a result, people may feel that just by being more present and attentive to their own experience that everything will become easier and feel better. The assumption is that the inner world of thoughts, emotions, and sensations will be more peaceful, calm, and tolerable. Additionally, people may encourage and even push others into the practice of mindfulness, sometimes before they are ready, willing, or even interested in doing so. This may hinder or even block the person from trying on his or her own in the future by leaving a bad taste in his or her mouth. Whether it is a friend, a loved one, colleague, child, or client, if we see others struggling in a particular way, There is often an empathetic inclination to suggest that they learn how to practice mindfulness meditation. I see this scenario particularly with parents, teachers, and therapists who attempt to push mindfulness practice on adolescents in what seem to be attempts to modify behavior or instill a sense of 
personal responsibility. Often this shows up as an attempt to control or to alert and alarm the teens that they aren't worried or concerned about their lives in the correct or appropriate ways. This may be well-intentioned, but I see it backfire more times than not. I have found much more fruitful results when we approach others with empathy and interest rather than demands and negotiations. We have begun to see a similar phenomenon in certain parts of the business sector. Corporations implement a mindfulness program for staff and employees, which at first glance may seem like a kind of generous gesture, and perhaps it is. However, we may want to consider the underlying motive. Is it an attempt to encourage individuals to better accept and tolerate poor conditions? Is the intent to use mindfulness to develop more efficient workers, students, and managers? In such circumstances, it can seem as if the motive is to get people to be more mindless by attempting to undermine critical thinking and active investigation into the circumstances of their lives. Wouldn't mindfulness play a better role in solving problems if we set out to improve the conditions of the systems in which people operate, rather than attempting to get people to better accept those conditions? Knowing how highly corruptible human motivation can be, I suspect that we would benefit from holding an ethical framework and foundation as fundamental to the implementation of mindfulness programs, especially as they continue to make inroads into the American workplace. Number five, mindfulness is not a state of passivity. Mindfulness is certainly not about having some type of mental and emotional lobotomy. The definition of non judgmental awareness may imply that we enter into a state of passivity, detachment, and indifference. It does not and should not imply that we learn to like or accept everything that happens. There has to be some room for critical thought and the ability to discern. Mindfulness is an active function of consciousness. When we are in a state of passivity, we typically wander and daydream. This is an experience of being on autopilot, where we often allow the mind to wander about in a very passive mode of operating. I would even suggest that passivity is the, actually the opposite of mindfulness. Mindfulness has alertness and an energetic quality to it. It has a wakefulness that allows us to connect to our experience more deeply. It provides the ability to attune to our surroundings and to others. It is not characterized as a state of ambivalence and passivity, but rather an active interest and curiosity toward experience. It is through our own will, volition, and intention that we experience mindfulness. Mindfulness is active, not passive, plain and simple. Number 6. Mindfulness is not ethically neutral. Mindfulness is ultimately a responsive awareness. It is not a passive function of the mind. Mindfulness is the ability to respond to life in a way that decreases harm. It's a living and breathing way to experience. It's a method of looking and perceiving. Mindfulness can be likened to the function of a mirror. It simply reflects what is present. It is able to do so internally and externally. Whether it is a sound, sight, taste, or a thought, Mindfulness simply knows the object as it is. The ethical component is the relationship we have with or to the object. Once we develop the ability to differentiate awareness of the object and from the object, we are able to see the relationship between it and ourselves. We are able to create a triangle of experience, awareness-object-relationship. We are able to sustain our mental capacities in a wholesome feedback loop and change our relationship to how we experience and respond to our lives. We find that mindfulness practice rests in two basic questions. What is arising in my experience? How am I relating to it? The first question is about awareness. The second is about the ethical nature of how experience is being held. Or in other words, how are we relating to it? The ethical role of mindfulness practice is to develop a non-harming intention toward whatever object arises. 
The ability to do this allows us to move through our lives under the best possible conditions. While maintaining the view that pain, stress, loss, and difficulty are inevitable aspects of life, we can learn to respond with empathy and care rather than anger and fear. Chapter 2 Secular and Classical Mindfulness What is Secular Mindfulness? Secular Mindfulness, SM, is perhaps the most well-known form of mindfulness in the U.S. due to its close association with the practice of Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, MBSR. MBSR began in 1979 at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center as a tool for pain management. Since then, a wide range of mindfulness-based interventions have been developed and successfully implemented, yielding positive results for their intended populations. Research continues to suggest that therapeutic modalities and programs based on mindfulness to be effective particularly for reducing anxiety, depression, and stress. Within this framework, SM is understood as a psychological concept and a set of techniques emphasizing the sustained application of attention, focus, and awareness. Essentially, SM reduces the practice of mindfulness to a simple science and practice of attention training, often described as the cognitive ability to bring one's own attention to the direct experience of what is happening within the present moment. It is loosely based on the teachings of mindfulness found within the Theravada Buddhist meditation tradition. It's important to know that some of the studies reporting the positive results of mindfulness-based programs can be potentially misleading. The reality is that the benefits of mindfulness practice usually develop slowly over a period of time. The positive aspects are not always immediate, even though at the first introduction to the practice, individuals may report a sense of relief. People often find that an eight-week MBSR course may only scratch the surface of difficulties that dwell far below our everyday conscious awareness. MBSR and other SM models generally don't address the ways in which the individual may be living in a way that could be perceived as unethical, inasmuch as facilitators may not want to appear to be passing judgment. When mental health professionals strive to maintain an objective view of the clients they serve, they may be unintentionally limiting the capacity for personal growth by being a conscientious and rigidly objective observer. This can present a dilemma of sorts. Individuals practicing mindfulness may also be engaging in behaviors that cause harm to themselves or others. In SM practice circles, there seems to be a lack of personal accountability and no framework for getting to some of the root causes and conditions that give rise to destructive behaviors. This can create a type of bypass by focusing on surface issues. It is also common in the mindfulness community that meditation itself creates what is known as a spiritual bypass, where individuals use meditation itself as a way to repress unpleasant internal states, while avoiding behavior and attitudes that may be causing harm. We should never dismiss the power of denial and the many masterful ways in which it can work. Employing an ethical approach that acts as a counterweight is among the most important practices we can develop. One of the best examples of the power of holding people accountable is the process found in the 12-step recovery programs. This is one of the fundamental reasons why people succeed within the various 12-step programs. In the peer-based culture of the 12-step recovery, heavy emphasis is placed on personal accountability. A primary role is the willingness to look and change behaviors and attitudes that are harmful. Within the 12-step program's sponsor-slash-sponsee relationship, there is a strong emphasis on honesty, openness, and personal accountability. This relationship manifests when somebody new to the program seeks out an experienced member with whom he or she feels some degree of resonance. The sponsor simply guides him or her through the process of the 12 steps. 
in an agreed-upon form that typically allows for a degree of transparency, vulnerability, and trust. As mindfulness coaching and mentoring became more prevalent, these modalities will be more effective if a component of accountability is built into the teacher-student model that holds ethics as a core value, placing emphasis on non-harming thoughts, attitudes, and behaviors. The mindfulness coaching and mentoring process will succeed more fully when we are clear about how ethics is defined, understood, and applied. It's unfortunate that currently there is very little mention of this issue within the majority of SM programs, trainings, and practices. What is classical mindfulness? Classical mindfulness has been generously delivered to us through the Theravada Buddhist tradition. The Theravada tradition is known as the oldest school of Buddhism and has a long and rich history of study, practice, and monasticism. In particular, it is the school of Buddhism that acknowledges and claims mindfulness to be the direct path to liberation from suffering in this world. In fact, it may be safe to say that the Theravada tradition is directly responsible for the current and widespread interest in the theory and practice of mindfulness. For over two centuries, mindfulness has been a living force within the Theravada tradition. It has been the predominant religion of Sri Lanka, Burma, and Thailand. Currently, Theravada Buddhists number over 100 million worldwide. Even today, new monasteries are being established around the globe. Since the early 1970s, we have seen the emergence of practice centers solely dedicated to the cultivation of mindfulness. Places such as the Insight Meditation Society, IMS, in Massachusetts and Spirit Rock in California have been offering mindfulness and loving-kindness retreats for decades. These retreats range from weekend getaways to three-month-long intensive programs where participants practice in silence around the clock and may do sitting meditation for as much as 10 hours a day. Many of the people who teach regularly at these centers have a strong background not only in mindfulness but also in Theravada Buddhism. Some teachers also have a private therapeutic practice and are trained as psychotherapists, while others are not. The Theravada tradition, most commonly known as insight meditation, has been cultivated and practiced in the United States by a wide range of practitioners and an ongoing diverse teaching community. Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg, and Jack Cornfield are teachers most popularly known in this movement. All three have written numerous books on the subject and will teach retreats worldwide. Theravada draws its theory, philosophy, practice, and application from a large body of work called the Pali Canon. The Pali Canon is the primary text in which Buddhist scholars and monastics generally accept as the oldest record of what the historic Buddha may have taught. Over 2,500 years ago, Siddhartha Gautama, Buddha, through his own diligent efforts, reached a spiritual awakening and began teaching others how they could do the same. His core teachings and practices were originally passed on orally, as his teachings spread rapidly through the Indian subcontinent and other parts of Southeast Asia. Over time, these teachings were written down on palm leaves at the Fourth Buddhist Council in Sri Lanka, sometime around 100 BCE. Due to the fact that over 400 years had passed since Gautama Buddha's death, it is unclear how strong the connection is between the written Pali Canon and what the Buddha might have actually said or taught. Of course, we will never know with certainty. The entire Pali Canon has been translated into English by several people and is available in both print and online sources. In recent years, there has been a growing interest among academic scholars to study the canon from a range of perspectives, including its historical, philological, and philosophical roots. Many scholars have looked into its cultural context, acknowledging the worldview and religious traditions that may have influenced the minds of the people with whom the Buddha shared his teachings. There is also widespread interest in an etymological survey of the Pali and Sanskrit languages. Clearly, there is still much to be learned about the message the Buddha hoped to convey to humankind. One way or another, 
the Buddha's teachings, known as the Dharma, have landed in the modern era and are likely here to stay. As to how it will influence us, or how we may influence it, I trust much will be revealed in years to come. It is unfortunate that the historical Buddha has generally been labeled as a religious figure, thus creating a wide range of confusion and associative baggage that typically comes with religion in general. The further back we travel into the world of Buddhism, the less religious in its theory and ideas it is. In fact, the Buddha himself refused to answer many questions that Buddhism subsequently decided to tackle as it spread and grew. The Buddha claimed to teach just one thing, suffering and its end. This is the process clearly articulated and outlined in the Four Noble Truths. The Theravada tradition has been quite diligent and conservative about honoring and preserving the core teachings found within the Pali Canon. These have been respectfully preserved through its long and successful monastic tradition. A tradition that has also seen a great number of Westerners take the monastic vows. We now have access to the teachings by individuals who are well-versed, not only in the English language, but also in the limitations of the modern world. Specifically, the overindulgence of sensory pleasure and all the suffering in the form of addiction. A key element that these monastics have been able to convey in a very real and accessible way is that the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion easily corrupt human experience. And until we see this for ourselves, we continue to create suffering. Hopefully, we begin to identify alternative ways of going about things. Monasticism is one such alternative, though its demands are considerable. Embodying the practices set forth by the Buddha within the context of more mainstream everyday life is another. To do this, we begin by taking on the five training practices that I outline on ethics in a later chapter. If we are searching for happiness that will sustain us, we have to place careful attention on the role ethics will play in our lives. Chapter 3 Defining the Mind What is the mind? If we consider the limitations of words and concepts from our own direct meditative experience, we find ourselves in yet another dilemma. We don't really have an adequate definition for the term the mind. How then can we even talk about a practice called mindfulness? What does it mean to develop or have? fullness of mind. Fullness of what, we might ask. As we will see, early Buddhism offers a clear and concise definition of the mind and how it works. What is consciousness? From an early Buddhist perspective, consciousness arises and passes away in each and every moment as an ongoing series of events. Each mind moment is like a mini-episode of experience. This process continues again and again in an ongoing stream of conscious awareness. Consciousness is not a thing that exists so much as an event that continuously occurs. Conscious experience of mind is not a noun, but rather a verb. The mind is not a fixed thing. It's a process that can be experienced and influenced. Consciousness is not something located at the back of the mind that looks out onto the world. It emerges when we come into contact with the world. Looking more closely into the early Buddhist texts, we see that the Buddha doesn't seem too concerned or particularly interested in what consciousness is, but rather what the conditions are that allow it to occur. Moving forward, we will use the terms mind and consciousness synonymously. Some years ago, when I really started to dig into an academic study of the Dharma, I became very interested in a teacher named Stephen Batchelor. I had been listening to some of his talks, had to read a few of his books, and I was finding his approach to understanding the Buddhists' earliest teachings to be extremely informed and pragmatic. He has a keen ability to take abstract ideas and deliver them in a way that tends to demystify the meditative experience as well as some of the more esoteric aspects of the Dharma. I also found the ideas that he was digging into, 
and teasing apart, were some of the same ideas in which I was interested, particularly the lists that we find at the heart of early Buddhism, namely the Four Noble Truths, the Five Aggregates, Dependent Origination, the Role of Attention, and the Embodied Practice of Mindfulness. After reading his book, Confession of a Buddhist Atheist, and streaming his talks pertaining to secular Buddhism, I was looking to find a way in which I might be able to learn more from him directly and found that Stephen and his wife, Martine, were teaching a study course entitled Secular Buddhism at the Bar Center for Buddhist Studies, BCBS. I immediately signed up and booked a flight up to Bar, Massachusetts. Over the course of five days, there were morning and evening lectures, periods of dialogue and reflection with other participants, followed by periods of silent meditation. It was such a rich and meaningful way to study and practice the Dharma. One of the key benefits of participating in a program like this is there are periods of time to do sitting meditation practice to explore some of the teachings offered earlier that same day. The main point was that the Buddha's teachings were intended to be pragmatic rather than dogmatic. What was most beneficial for me was how the Buddha's articulation of Nama Rupa Vinyana, which translated as name, form, consciousness, was articulated. In short, this is how the Buddha defined the mind. The simple analysis of human consciousness was very accessible both cognitively and through direct meditative experience. As I spent an afternoon in meditation, I kept looking into my awareness to see contact, feeling, perception, inclination, and attention. I kept moving my attention around and made contact with everything around me. Then I started to do this within walking meditation. I could verify for myself that these five factors were in every moment, and I could choose where my attention would rest within them. I could explore the world of perception both internally and externally, seeing that I had a name for every object in my field of awareness. This process was automatic. I was able to see how everything had a feeling and that I had some type of stance or attitude toward everything that arose. If I became distracted within the contents of my mind in the form of plans or memories, I would just notice my perception. Every idea I had about the future was just a perception, and I was either inclined toward it or away from it. This was also true for the past. I spent most of the days exploring the present time experience of my mind, Nama Rupa Vinyana. It allowed me to be creative and curious about my practice. It allowed me to be more open and less technically concerned in my application. I was also able to gain a strong sense of confidence because everything I experienced could easily be placed into one of these factors. Contact, feeling, perception, inclination, and attention. Of conscious awareness. By using the tools of contact and attention, I could see cause and effect as it played out in my inner world of thoughts and emotions. Seeing clearly that thoughts would influence emotions and vice versa. This simple analysis of the mind can become a most wonderful meditation to perform. It allows for openness, curiosity, and a rich embodied sense of wonderment. Most importantly, it can be done in any and every moment of consciousness. Below is a graphic of how the mind is described within the context of early Buddhism, which again is clearly defined as Nama Rupa Vinyana which translates as name-form consciousness. This simply means that we experience forms and objects and we have names and labels for them. We know what things are, and in most instances, we know automatically and immediately. We have names for forms. We are able to contact them, feel them, perceive them, incline toward or away from them, and pay attention to them. The mind is made up of these five mental factors that arise and pass away in each moment of consciousness. Alongside them are the five aggregates. Name form. Five aggregates. One, contact, faso. Form, rupa. 
Two, feeling, vadana, feeling. Three, perception, sana, perception. Four, inclination, sankara, inclination. Five, attention, manasakaro, consciousness, vijnana. The diagram above outlines the core components of the mind that are present in every moment of conscious awareness. This aggregate system is how the mind consciousness is defined within early Buddhism as evidenced by the early Buddhist texts. Name, form, is the drive and cognitive ability that allows us to navigate the aggregate system. This means we can develop a degree of choice over what objects we make contact with and therefore pay attention to which in turn can have tremendous positive or negative consequences for the individual. Here again, we will find the role of ethics is crucial. Contact. We make contact with the physical world, rupa, through the five sense gates, and through the mental world with the mind, nama, gate. This creates the baseline conditions for consciousness to arise. The eyes see shapes and colors. The ears hear sounds and the body can feel sensations, while the mind considers or creates a thought or simply becomes captured by one. Contact has the characteristic of touching. We could say that consciousness cooperates fully with its own mental factors and creates a sense of flow and fluidity, such as a sense of streaming and movement, hence the term stream of consciousness. Mindfulness practice typically begins by intentionally placing and sustaining the attention on the sensation of the in and out breath for a period of time. This is the core instruction and basis for the practice of mindfulness of breathing, to intentionally make contact with the process of breathing and sustain the attention at that location. Feeling. While contact is being made, a feeling also arises. These are commonly categorized as the three feeling tones of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. The mental factor of feeling is also the same term and idea we see within the second foundation of mindfulness, impressions. As a mental factor, feeling is the effective mode in which any object is experienced. It has the characteristic of creating a felt sense or impression and experiences the full impact of the object. Its primary role in the operating system is to provide the initial input that will color, shape, or alter all the other aspects of cognition. It is for precisely this reason that feeling, vadana, plays such a critical role in early Buddhist teachings and is one of the key players in the game of liberation. One of the common dilemmas that we face when we translate early Buddhist ideas into our modern idiom is that the English language is much more complex. Our words are typically much more specific than those found in the Pali language of the canon. The term feeling is a great example of that problem in that here feeling does not mean emotion. English dictionaries may have up to 10 or more different definitions for the word feeling. The most common usage for the word is emotion, as in, I feel happy or sad. However, there are many other ways to use it. We may imply a physical sensation, as in I feel hot or cold, pressure or tightness. It may imply a preference, I feel like Chinese food instead of Italian. It may imply a movement or act, I feel like staying in tonight. Feeling is applied to a very wide range of experiences, attitudes, as well as our overall general effect or mood. Within the structure of early Buddhism, the term is much more narrowly defined. It points specifically to the impression that it is created by the initial contact from any sensory data. The experience is simply felt and known as being pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. It encompasses both bodily and mental feelings. However, it does not include emotion in its range of meaning, although it may provide the initial input for the emotional experience. If we can identify the effective quality of a feeling, it will give us a helpful framework for what types of emotions may arise out of that initial sensory information. 
If we can learn to identify and access feeling states and begin to learn how we relate to them, we may start to unlock some of the deepest patterns of our conditioning and reactivity. The good news is that we can learn to use those three feeling states, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, as a gauge to begin to turn things around. Noticing whether the felt sense or impression of the present time experience is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral is something that we can begin to learn easily and in most cases quickly. Perception The role of perception is to differentiate one object from another and to assign a type of quick and dirty qualitative value to that object. It is through the mental factor of perception that the world makes sense to us. It is where we form intelligence through memory and analysis. It is the ability to recognize something that has been previously experienced or known. It is the chief activator to our memory system and makes meaning of our memories. It enables us to interpret what the object is and it does so by remembering its most basic features such as shape, color, texture, smell, and so forth. The role of mindfulness is to train or educate our perception to be a more in line with reality, to see things as they are. In mindfulness, we are encouraged to learn how to question and investigate our perceptions. Are they causing us peace or restlessness? Are they even true? Most cognitive behavior programs encourage people to question perceptions, to challenge views, opinions, and core beliefs. In many ways, all forms of Buddhist meditation can be seen as perception reorganizing. That is, to see the ever-changing, unreliable, and impersonal nature of experience. Within the structure of early Buddhism, this would be called the cultivation of right or skillful view and is known to be the first factor in the Eightfold Path, which I will describe further in the next chapter. Impulses slash inclination Sankara, Satana, Sankapa. There are three specific terms that point to this aspect of consciousness and fall under the heading of impulses slash inclinations, translated from Sankara. In most cases, Sankara is translated to mean mental formations, a term that doesn't provide as much useful information. The most helpful definition for this term is inclination or impulses, as in we are inclined to do something. We have bodily, verbal, and mental sankara. This would sum up the ways we are inclined to act, to speak, and to think, which are often pre-programmed, automatic, and in many cases impulsive. For the sake of accuracy and for my own intention, to offer the widest possible range of meaning, I will outline each aspect of the mental factor below and construct a pragmatic framework for how they function within the experience of mind. A thorough investigation into the Pali Canon will reveal three ways Sankara is outlined and how it works. We should consider Sankara as the most diverse and complicated bundle of experiences that are contained within the mind. Sankara also holds the remaining two terms within its domain, Satana and Sankapa. Sankara literally means that which has been put together. Satana, which is an aspect of Sankara, embodies the full range of what has previously been dubbed mental sankara. Bhikkhu Bodhi translates this term to mean volition. Volition includes the act of willing, choosing, or resolving. So the major role of satana is the act of choosing and deciding what might be the skillful thing to do. Satana is derived from the term sitta. Here, sitta simply means mind-heart. It is the same term that we see in the contemplation of mind within the third foundation of mindfulness, attitudes. We often find that our entire organism is bombarded with a wide array of content that influences mind states, attitudes, emotions, temperament, and mood. Emotions often affect the choices and decisions that we make. And we find that if we are driven by anger, fear, or sadness, we won't always choose wisely. Again, the cultivation of ethics has significant positive consequences. Therefore, the majority role of satana is the ability to be mindful and take full advantage of the choices and decisions we make. It also allows us to work through our fears and vulnerabilities without becoming reactive.
making poor and often habitual decisions. Western psychology continues to address the need for emotional awareness. The emotional intelligence movement, led by Dr. Daniel Goleman, provides a tremendous resource for working with and understanding the human emotional landscape. We will take a closer look at that later on. The final term we find is sankapa, which translates as intention. Satana is what supplies the possibility for sankapa to occur. The role of intention within early Buddhism is extremely significant and therefore needs to be distinguished from volition. Cultivating intention is the second factor on the Eightfold Path, in which great emphasis is placed on ethics. In fact, intention is how the Buddha also defines the word karma, or the law of cause and effect. In the process of liberation, intention is the precise location in which the individual creates either wholesome or unwholesome karma. In everyday usage, we may find the terms volition and intention to be synonymous. But for the Buddha, the role they play within consciousness were different enough that he gave them slightly different meanings. Volition is the simple act of choosing or making a decision by exercising will. Intention has a specific aim or purpose, implying that the mind is focused on achieving a particular outcome. Volition may be habitual and automatic, while intention is well thought out. Intention is supported by a careful attention, or in early Buddhism, Yoniso Manisakaro. This is a great example of how clear comprehension can be utilized within the practice of mindfulness. Intention is the aspect of consciousness where the role of ethics is best developed. It is one of the core skills in the development and maintenance of ethical mindfulness. For us to begin to move toward understanding and developing ethical mindfulness, we need to acknowledge that in the Buddha's process of liberation, all mental formations, sankharas, need to be fully understood, so that we can begin to see what volitions, satanas, need to be activated and which ones need to be abandoned in order to cultivate ethical intentions, sankapa. By performing these three tasks, we move away from suffering and toward well-being. Attention. The final factor defining the mind is attention. The role of attention within the practice of mindfulness as well as its overall role in our lives is obviously tremendously important. Early Buddhism defines attention as making in the mind. Its function is to direct all the other mental factors toward an object. Attention is like the rudder of a ship directing it towards its destination. Attention manifests by colliding with whatever object it takes on and becomes confronted by that object, whether it be a sound, sight, or thought. This is to say that attention has an element of stress built right into it. It may be no surprise that many people struggle with it. Modern neuroscience is continuously studying the role and effects of attention. What we do know is that attention regulates emotion. Attention reaches forward and connects us to the world, defining and shaping our experience. Attention provides the mechanisms that underlie our awareness of the world. It is connected to the regulation of feelings and thoughts. Attention effectively defines and creates our reality. Oftentimes, mindfulness practice instructions use the words attention and awareness interchangeably, but this is not entirely accurate and can become confusing. To provide an example, imagine that you are overlooking a field from the top of a hill. Everything that you are taking in can be experienced with the container of awareness. Awareness is a panoramic view. Now, if you look through a pair of binoculars and focus on a tree, a flower, or a deer, that can be understood as attention. Attention is object-orientated. It connects with a specific aspect of something that arises within the greater field of awareness. We may say that awareness is wide and attention is narrow. Awareness is open and attention is focused. Attention is what we cut out of the field of awareness and examine more closely. In terms of early Buddhism, consciousness and awareness are synonymous. 
The only difference is that consciousness is to be fully known and awareness is to be cultivated. Ethical mindfulness is what will allow us to complete this task. We learn to know and we learn to respond. Wisdom is the knowing, ethics is the responding. For the Buddha, they could not be separated. Simply put, consciousness slash mind is the container that holds all of these factors together. From the view of Buddhist psychology, consciousness slash mind is an event, it is an episode, and it arises and passes away one moment at a time. It's really quite that simple. A good way to remember it is thinking of consciousness slash mind as a fist, which is comprised of the five fingers of contact, feeling, perception, inclination, and attention. As the old story goes, consciousness is like the king who never arrives alone but is always accompanied by his entourage. These five factors arise together and pass away together in every single moment of consciousness. This is the core structure of what constitutes the experience of mind. Mindfulness is the ability to navigate this system. A real-time example of how this works. As you are reading the words on this screen, you are making contact with the tiny black shapes that comprise this sentence. As contact is being made, you are able to understand and name, nama, these small black shapes as letters, and the words they form because you already know the English language, and your knowledge is engaged through your ability to remember, sati. Perception is what allows all of this to happen. Through perception, you are able to piece these words together so they make sense as you keep reading. You are both able to reflect on what these words say and consider your own ideas even as you read, because of the mental aggregate factor of perception. As you read the concepts that I am offering, you will see that you have a particular feeling toward them. They affect you, don't they? If you like what is being said, you may keep reading and find this experience to be pleasant, or you may disagree or not be all that interested and find this process confusing and unpleasant. Maybe the experience is neither, it's just neutral, and you may have no particular change at all. As you keep reading, you will find that you have some form of inclination, impulse, or a stance toward what is being said. Maybe you are inclined to keep reading, or you decide to open your browser and research some of what is being said, or update your Facebook page. Whatever the case may be, there are a wide range of experiences happening in this very moment, all of which are taking place within your own personal container of consciousness. You have the ability to choose which factors of the experience you pay attention to. Contact and attention are the forerunner of all experience. For this reason, we are encouraged to be better skilled at utilizing these functions of mind. As we gain more skill in being mindful, we start to develop a careful attention. Yoniso Manisakaro. This is the root skill within the development of ethical mindfulness. It balances our cognitive abilities with ethical factors. Throughout early Buddhism and the Pali Canon, the term mind is utilized and defined in three specific ways. Attention, mani sakaro, consciousness, vijnana, and mind-heart, sita. We need to train our attention so that we can fully know consciousness by understanding the factors that allow it to arise. We cultivate ethical intentions, thus liberating the heart-mind. So again, we see that the need for training, understanding, and ethics, these are three primary aspects of the Eightfold Path. By developing ethical mindfulness, we operate under the most favorable conditions available to us. Chapter 4 The Practice of Mindfulness the definitions of mindfulness and its practice that I offer here are merely meant to be educational, pragmatic, and useful. As my intention is to offer the widest view possible, I present a threefold perspective on mindfulness practice that will respect the form in which mindfulness has been delivered to us through the Theravada tradition and early Buddhism, offer critical analysis in some of the ways I believe mindfulness practice 
has been misunderstood in the greater secular mindfulness SM community. Outline some of the ideas and tools I have discovered in my personal practice. Working in clinical and correctional environments, as well as my ongoing study into a scholastic analysis of early Buddhism. The practice of mindfulness is clearly outlined within a Buddhist text entitled Satipatthana, defined as the direct path to realization. The translation used for Satipatthana is mindfulness. If we break the term into its roots, we find two very important ideas Sati, the ability to remember, to recognize, and to see clearly, and thana, a ground or foundation. Satipatthana is the ability to remember, to recognize, and to see clearly this ground. This refers to the impermanent, unreliable, stressful, and impersonal nature of all human experience. Mindfulness is ultimately about learning to navigate with skill the groundless ground of lived experience. My position is that, for it to function properly, it has to include learning to balance the role of ethics with the recognition of this process. Entering the domain of mindfulness practice starts with an acknowledgement that the human mind can be monitored. We can verify this possibility by bringing our awareness to the immediacy of our direct experience. As our mind regulates the flow of energy and information, we can learn to monitor this ongoing process in real time. We experience energy as sensations in the body. We can see that emotions also appear within the sensate body. We can learn to monitor information in the form of thoughts, ideas, perceptions, and intentions. More specifically, we can notice that some thoughts are the product of choice or decision, while others arise out of a random stream of consciousness in the form of episodes or mind moments. By learning to monitor the mind, we can measure the effect of its content by noticing how it influences our emotional states. We also see that we have a degree of influence over the experience by making small modifications and adjustments to our attention. We learn that we can also modify our experience by the application of ethical intentions, by being motivated by curiosity and kindness. Mindfulness can't be reduced to just one task or skill. It requires a whole range of applications that need to be maintained and balanced all at once. Mindfulness is a mode of operating. It provides us the ability to view our lives from a new and much wider perspective. It allows us to apply critical thinking and discernment, logic, ethics, and an openness to question old ideas and core beliefs. It allows for personal change and transformation. It supports confidence and trust that we can overcome the challenges that we face and create a way of life that promotes long-lasting well-being and true happiness. However, evolution did not give us this skill. We don't actually need mindfulness for basic survival. Herein lies the rub. It has to be cultivated and therefore earned. Learning how to establish mindfulness is not like learning to ride a bike. After developing the skills of bike riding, we can go years without getting on a bike and find that through our learned motor skills, we can easily ride again at any time. Mindfulness does not work in the same way. As a mode of operation, mindfulness is highly subject to decay. It needs to be maintained on a regular basis. As the saying goes, use it or lose it. The emphasis here is on sustained daily practice and consistent monitoring of what is happening in the moments of our lives. It is so fragile because it requires a host of qualities that are both cognitive and ethical in nature for it to function properly. Sustained mindfulness practice requires that we maintain willingness for self-honesty and self-reflection that challenges our defense mechanisms. It confronts our denial and shines a light on our regrets. It puts us right in the center of our vulnerability, and we don't often like that. This is why, when mindfulness practices start to actually work, people often run for the door. Awakening to the deepest patterns and habits of our suffering can be so uncomfortable that we may prefer to go back to sleep. If we explore the teachings found within the context of early Buddhism, 
we will quickly realize that the world of mindfulness is deeply rich in both meaning and application. As I noted earlier, within the current world of SM, the understanding and explanation of the term sati, mindfulness, has been limited to mean being attentive to the present moment. The SM perspective on this practice is unfortunately misleading and limited through its omission of any emphasis on ethics or the need for critical thinking or discernment. We repeatedly find an overemphasis on the cognitive component with no mention or consideration of the role that ethics play within the framework of the human experience. Without question, attention plays a key role in the development of sati mindfulness, but is certainly not the end sum game. We may also become frustrated by the reality that our attention is all over the place. We apply our attention toward our breathing, and distraction diverts it toward our plans, worries, and concerns. We bring our attention back, and in a pain, in our right knee pulls it away. We come back again until we realize we forgot to schedule an appointment. We become distracted by emotions, and we often run to distraction to avoid the underlying emotional stress. At some point, we need to actually feel the emotions that are present and learn how to access our fear, anger, and sadness. This is another place where ethics plays a significant role in that avoiding or tuning out emotions can cause harm. Often, the emotions we are trying to avoid may simply just need some attention. This is another example where we can create a spiritual bypass by turning attention away from unpleasant emotional states. In SM, it's not uncommon for people to use the attentional training aspect to repress difficult emotions. To fully establish a foundation of ethical mindfulness, we must balance cognitive skills with ethical qualities. And we also need to know which application is more appropriate at any given time. This requires an ongoing willingness and commitment to the practice. When faced with the paradox of cognition versus ethics, we may need to understand that it's a matter of both and rather than either or. It requires the ability to develop a clear understanding as how to balance these factors in a way that leads to transformation and well-being, a task that will last a lifetime. In the Pali Canon, the Satipatthana Sutta offers a detailed set of instructions on how to access each part of the experience of mindfulness and investigate how things are happening and how they relate to each other or arise in dependence on each other. The Satipatthana Sutta is known as the Buddha's teachings on the four foundations of mindfulness. In fact, all forms of mindfulness practice both the classical and secular perspectives, pull their application and instruction from this teaching in one way or another. To keep things simple, we could easily reduce the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness to four words, sensations, impressions, attitudes, and activities. The practice begins with the sensations of the body. Within the body, we have the direct experience of physical sensations, rupa. These include the sensations of the other four sense gates, sight, sound, smell, and taste. These sensations create a feeling or a feeling tone impressions, we can notice that whatever experience is coming in through one of the sense gates, it has an immediate impression on us. We experience all sensation as being pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. We can also notice that our mood, temperament, or mental state colors the mind. Attitude. At its most basic form, we seek out pleasantness. We dislike or reject unpleasantness, and we typically experience ambivalence and indifference toward that which is neutral. Mental attitude is strongly influenced by greed, hatred, and delusion. We can notice if one of these mind aptitudes is present or not. Activities The activities of the mind are just another way to save thinking. We can, in fact, think about thinking. We can notice thoughts as plans, memories, fantasies, and desires. In the field of cognitive neuroscience, this ability is defined as metacognition. One of my favorite explanations of the four foundations is the analogy of a pasture. Each of the foundations can become a pasture of awareness. 
We can bring our present time attention into the whole of the body and see what is arising and what is present. As our ability to concentrate becomes stronger, we can simply hang out with the direct experience of the body and let everything else fall into the background. We can apply our attention toward the world of feelings and see what is arising within that pasture. The same applies to the attitude of the mind and the activity of the thoughts themselves. We might simply notice if we are planning or remembering, if we are contrasting and comparing ourselves with others, or if we are rehearsing a future conversation or trying to correct a past argument. The four foundations of mindfulness are a set of practices through which we can develop a more refined set of skills for understanding the world of both internal and external landscapes. We can see the interplay that happens within the world of sensations, emotions, and thoughts. We can begin to see our lives through the broader lens of body, heart, and mind. First Foundation of Mindfulness Body Sensations Mindfulness of the Breathing Body Once we get settled into this form of practice, we apply mindfulness toward the experience of breathing. We know breathing in as breathing in, and we know breathing out as breathing out. We know if each breath is long, or if it's short, or it's deep, or if it's shallow. We establish mindfulness of breathing and then attempt to allow our breathing to settle into a natural rhythm. Establishing and working with mindfulness of breathing can be seen as a twofold process. At first, we may just settle into the direct experience of breathing itself and establish a degree of concentration. We can also expand mindfulness of breathing to the experience of the whole body, establishing mindfulness of both breath sensation and body sensation. We can describe this as mindfulness of the breathing body. Both are important and beneficial practices to develop. Mindfulness of postures. The next set of practices is directed to the four postures, bringing mindfulness to the experiences of walking, sitting, standing, and lying down. Mindfulness practice need not be simply reduced to formal sitting practice. Ultimately, we are striving to have mindfulness in every moment of our lives. As we walk, we are usually concerned about what will happen when we get to our destination. Mindfulness of the body includes all four of these postures and should be practiced as such. It is valuable to also apply mindfulness of breathing to the four postures. Mindfulness and clear comprehension, basic understanding. The next set of practices is defined as clear comprehension, or we could say basic understanding. This aspect of mindfulness can be described as knowing fully what one is attending to. It requires the ability to both be with and to know. Its practice brings the ability to think clearly and accurately, and an evenness of mind. In early Buddhism, this ability is a crucial aspect of the path as it leads to full knowledge and liberation from suffering. There are four particular kinds of clear comprehension within the Pali texts. The first is to have clear understanding of what is beneficial. Before engaging in an activity, we consider whether or not it would be beneficial, or we might ask, would it be useful? Is what we are about to do of service to others or to myself? Whether something is a benefit or use implies consideration of the ethics of the activity. Is what I am about to do likely to cause harm or not? If there is no benefit in the activity, it is to be put aside. This involves the cognitive aspects of the mind by enacting critical thought, analysis, and contemplation. As an aspect of mindfulness, clear comprehension plays a critical role. This is one of the key reasons why the term non-judgmental, as it is used in SM, can be problematic. We need to allow room for the discernment of what is beneficial because it's what allows us to make the necessary adjustments that improve our lives. The second aspect of clear comprehension builds on the first by asking the question, is now the right or suitable time for such activity? We may discern that what we are about to do may have benefit or could be useful, but we also want to consider whether it is the correct time or place for it. We all know that timing is an important part of our lives and our relationships with others. 
A lot can be learned and discerned by being mindful of our timing with our speech and actions. This helps keep us on guard. The third aspect of clear comprehension is to consider whether the action is within an appropriate domain or safe territory. If we wander too far or astray from what is right in front of us, we may find that we will be vulnerable to the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion. What are considered to be the appropriate domains are the four foundations of mindfulness themselves. We learn to keep our awareness within sensations, feelings, attitudes, and activities. Hence this, also called the meditator's domain. Keeping our awareness consistent within the four foundations is what allows us to be fully present for the moments of our lives. We learn to see that so much of our stress and anxiety is a result of thinking about things that aren't actually happening. They are imagined fears of the future or some sense of sadness or anger about the past. When we can be mindful of these activities, we can take a few breaths, look around and re-arrive back into our direct experience. We let go of the mind and find many moments of freedom if and when we do so. We remember the ground as we learn how to update our system. The final aspect of clear comprehension is traditionally called non-delusion. This is the fruit of practicing the previous three applications. Non-delusion simply means that we are now able to see things through the proper lens of wisdom or understanding. We know without any doubt what is of benefit, what is suitable or appropriate, and if the timing is right. We are able to stay grounded with what is happening. We learn how to not cause ourselves distress or harm by wandering off too far within the contents of our imagined fears and worries. One of the most fascinating and beautiful aspects of the human mind is creativity and imagination. The ability to imagine, to create, and to be creative. It is the source of the world's art, poetry, music, film, and all creative things that we truly love. However, this imagination of the mind can also provide us with an intense and overwhelming suffering. Imagine some of your deepest fears, insecurities, and ideas about who and what you are. What are the sources of your imagined desperation and regrets? We create things mentally that are in fact not real, and we can be intensely affected by what we imagine. The world of imagination can easily evoke strong emotional responses. It is also precisely for this reason that the role of ethics plays an important part in our inner life. By being able to establish clear comprehension toward our creative imagination, we can inspire beautiful mind states while overcoming those states of mind that lead us to anguish and suffering. Of course, we have to be able to see it to overcome it, and that takes sustained and committed practice. 32 Anatomical Parts of the Body the set of mindfulness of body instructions is designed to bring us into the deepest aspects of body awareness and is interwoven within the next set. Understanding the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. This extremely precise and methodical practice of the 32 parts of the body may provide us the essential framework to break through to a deeper understanding of the true nature of the body. The practice of the 32 parts is rarely mentioned within Western-style secular mindfulness or classical mindfulness. This practice leads one to develop the deepest forms of concentration while also acknowledging in a very real and practical way the limitations of the body and deeper sense of acceptance for what it means to live inside this human form. Four Elements Earth, Air, Fire, and Water the practice of the four elements was around long before the time of Buddha and has a place within many other forms of spirituality. As a meditation practice, it encourages us to break free from seeing the body in terms of names, parts, and definitions. Its aim is to allow for a deeper investigation into the energetic qualities and sensations of the mind-heart-body. Death Reflections the final set of practices of mindfulness of the body requires reflections on death. Many Buddhist monks will meditate on the reality of death every morning. 
The paradox is that while death is certain, the time of death is uncertain. This provides the proper motivation and commitment to practice. In our culture, there is a huge denial around death and dying. Meditating and reflecting on death may not be for everybody. But at some point, we may want to consider the fact that we all will die. This may help us make important changes in our lives. Second Foundation of Mindfulness Feelings, Impressions The role of mindfulness in the second foundation encompasses the ability to both feel and to know. This is why I prefer to use the term impressions. We simply feel the sensations of the body, emotions, and thoughts, and we begin to know them as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. We feel pain and know it is unpleasant. We feel comfort and know it is pleasant. Being mindful of feelings allows us to lengthen the gap between stimulus, what happens to us, and response, how we respond to what happens to us, and shows us the deepest pattern of our conditioning. Mindfulness of feelings also points us back to the reality of impermanence, the absence of a solid agent or a fixed self. In essence, feelings have to be noted. By noting the arising of a feeling, we are able to see its passing. We come to see the stark reality that because there is pain, there are painful feelings. Because there is comfort, there are pleasant feelings, and so on. This is how feelings should be dealt with during meditation. By being aware of them, by being mindful of them, and by taking note of them. If we can see the arising and passing of feelings, we are better able to avoid the craving and aversion that is deeply associated with them. By not attaching to feelings, we are liberated from the suffering that ensues. Third Foundation of Mindfulness Mind Attitudes The third foundation of mindfulness instructs us to bring mindfulness toward mind. Here, we are looking for the factors that color the mind or consciousness. In particular, we are investigating the presence and absence of greed, hatred, and delusion. Buddhist psychology acknowledges that, in fact, greed, hatred, and delusion are mental factors. These factors arise in unwholesome states of mind. Interestingly, they arise at the point of contact and feeling, and begin to corrupt the mind by allowing craving and reactivity to take hold. As we reach for pleasant, push away unpleasant, and become confused and ambivalent toward neutral. This is why I prefer to use the term attitude of the mind. We can simply notice if we are wanting, not wanting, or wandering. We are all very familiar with the experience of attitude. Attitude colors our mind, yet we have a tremendous amount of influence over our attitudes. The mental attitude of greed will usually manifest as the experience of anticipation. We may feel like we are waiting for or wanting something to happen. It may also be the source of much of our anxiety. We may become restless and impatient, bored or frustrated. This attitude of mind can cause us a lot of avoidable suffering. Bringing mindfulness to this attitude of mind allows us to unhook from its strong, often debilitating grip. The mental attitude of hatred will often show up in the form of resistance. If we encounter any type or form of unpleasantness, we attempt to avoid, resist, and reject. We may impatiently wait for it to go away, thus giving rise to reactivity, as we are able to hold or tolerate that which is unpleasant. Interestingly, we may have a wide range of attitudes that color our experience of neutrality. Again, we may see ambivalence, indifference, boredom, and confusion. If we can bring interest and curiosity toward experiences of neutrality, we may experience ease, contentment, and a sense of peace and well-being. The range of attitudes here is wide and nuanced. It is for precisely this reason that mindfulness of mind states and mental attitudes can have tremendous positive consequences for us if we are able to access and put this mindfulness practice into action. Fourth Foundation of Mindfulness Truths, Mental Activities Within the contemplation of the Fourth Foundation of Mindfulness, there are five sets of practices. Traditionally, this contemplation is defined as mindfulness of dhammas. Here, dhamma just means things, which isn't a very helpful translation. 
Some of the ways I have seen this translated are mindfulness of truth, objects, categories, activities, thoughts, and so forth. In essence, what we are looking for is mindfulness of thinking, or as I like to define it, of mental activities. The skill is similar to metacognition, a term from neuroscience I referenced earlier, meaning the ability to think about thinking. The first set of practices within the context of the fourth foundation is learning to understand the five hindrances and how to overcome them. Essentially, the path to liberation will depend on how well we are able to overcome these hindrances. They are called hindrances because they hinder or block our ability to be at ease and create various forms of reactivity, stress, and mental anguish. The five hindrances are craving, aversion, restlessness, lethargy, and doubt. The hindrance of craving is the experience of wanting something pleasant. It shows up as anticipation and anxiety, and its root is greed. Guarding the sense gates by practicing protective awareness is one of the best strategies to overcome craving. I will say more on this later. Aversion is the opposite of craving. It is the experience of wanting what is unpleasant to go away. It shows up as frustration and agitation, and its root is hatred. The ethical heart practice of metta, or loving-kindness, is the most effective tool to work with aversion. Restlessness as a hindrance is typically associated with contents of the mind and may not be the same experience as physical restlessness, although they can and often are directly linked. Restlessness as mental activity is likened to worry or remorse. Typically, worry about the future and remorse or regret about the past. Restlessness may have flavors of greed, hatred, or delusion as its root, but most of the time a low-grade sense of confusion is what gives rise to mental restlessness. Mindfulness of breathing will almost always be the most effective strategy to overcome mental restlessness. Lethargy is the experience of a sluggish, sleepy, and spaced-out mind. The most common translation for lethargy is usually sloth and torpor, but for most of us, these terms carry little meaning. Lethargy is the experience of being disinterested and unengaged. Lethargy can be overcome by moderation in food intake and practicing clarity of mind by developing clear understanding of what is happening. Lethargy is often at the root of procrastination and can be associated with a feeling of being stuck. Doubt is without a doubt the most challenging hindrance to overcome. It is the hindrance that is most likely to keep us from practicing. Doubt has delusion for its root and may also contain all or some of the other hindrances. Doubt can be the experience of a full-on hindrance attack. It is the mental attitude of why bother and what's the point. Being skilled in ethical behavior as well as having solid knowledge of mindfulness teachings can overcome doubt. Interestingly, within the context of the Satipatthana Sutta, good friendship and wise conversation are considered antidotes for each of the five hindrances. This points to the importance of having healthy and authentic relationships with others as a key component in the development of external mindfulness. It is also one of the many examples that ethics cannot and should not be separate from the practice of mindfulness. Suffice it to say that the development of ethical mindfulness is the most effective strategy for overcoming these hindrances, thus allowing us to operate under the best possible conditions by furthering our progress toward liberation and true happiness. The second set of practices within the Four Foundations of Mindfulness shows the Buddha's affinity for repetition by reminding us to continue to explore the full range of our experience. Within this set of practice, we are invited to explore the five aggregates. The five aggregates are form, feeling, perception, inclination, and consciousness. Being able to work within the context of the five aggregates as a meditation practice is both exciting and useful. The five aggregates will be outlined in detail in the chapter on defining the mind. The third set of practices brings mindfulness to the six sense spheres. This exercise is twofold. We can experience the object of a sound and the knowing of the object as sound. We apply this method to all the sense spheres. 
This practice will greatly improve our ability to monitor experience objectively. We see all mental experience, including thoughts, as objects. Being able to bring mindfulness to the six sense gates is a valuable skill that allows us to develop a deeper sense of presence and objectivity, thus learning to take what we experience less personally. The fourth set of mindfulness practices focuses on the awakening factors, of which there are seven. The seven awakening factors are mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy, serenity, concentration, and equanimity. Practice related to the awakening factors involves a twofold examination. One, we are asked to identify whether any or all of these awakening factors are present within the mind. And two, we are encouraged to know that conditions will inspire these states to arise. Here again, we are inclining the mind to monitor the presence and absence of specific factors. As an awakening factor, mindfulness primes the pump by allowing us to settle in and begin the process. The second awakening factor, investigation, implies a sense of curiosity and interest. This term is important because it is what activates a careful attention based on conscious concern, interest, and curiosity, the basis for empathy. The middle three factors, energy, joy, and serenity, are usually associated with pleasant and subtle mental states that arise in meditation. These states unfold into the experience of concentration and collectedness, and ultimately flow into the embodied experience of equanimity the perfect balance of wisdom and compassion. I will outline the role of equanimity more fully in the chapter on heart practices. The Satipatthana Sutta concludes with a reflection on the Four Noble Truths. All schools of Buddhism hold the teachings of the Four Noble Truths to be the very core and heart of the Dharma. In fact, it's understood that all the teachings of the Buddha are contained within the structure of the Four Noble Truths. In one text, one of the Buddha's primary students, named Sariputta, reminds us that just as the footprints of all the animals of the jungle can fit inside that of an elephant, so it is true with the Dharma. All of the Buddha's teachings are to be found within the structure of the Four Noble Truths. The fact that secular mindfulness has been either unwilling or uninterested in including the practices of the Four Noble Truths is quite unfortunate. A simple and pragmatic look at these teachings points directly to the brilliance of the Buddha's message. When it comes down to it, the million-dollar question is, what are we supposed to be mindful of? From the perspective of early Buddhism, the answer is that we need to practice mindfulness of the Four Noble Truths. The whole structure of mindfulness practice is completely undermined if we don't acknowledge their practical brilliance. The Four Noble Truths Number one, the truth reality of stress and suffering, dukkha. Number two, the cause of suffering is repetitive craving, tana. Number three, the release of suffering is possible, niroda. Number four, the path that leads to the end of suffering is available, maga, through the eightfold path. As stated in the Pali Canon texts, Such is stress, dukkha. It can be fully known. It has been fully known. Such is craving, tana. It can be abandoned and let go of. It has been abandoned and let go of. Such is release, niroda. It can be experienced. It has been experienced. Such is the process path, maga. It can be cultivated. It has been cultivated. When we begin to study or attempt to understand mindfulness and the psychology of present-time awareness, we need to have a foundation for what we are hoping to accomplish. I recommend the following. The intent is to know suffering, its cause, its release, and the process that allows this to occur, namely the Four Noble Truths. The knowing of this process is developed within the framework and practice of mindfulness meditation and then applied to all areas of our lives. The development of mindfulness plays a key role in the destruction of greed, hatred, and delusion in which ethics plays a significant role. 
the study of the Buddhism, Dharma, and the practice of mindfulness should go hand in hand, as each has the ability to inform the other. A balanced approach will produce the best result. The Eightfold Path The Eightfold Path is the process that allows us to achieve liberation from suffering and true happiness in this life. The Eightfold Path is made up of eight skills in three principal areas. Understanding, skillful, one, view, and two, intention. Ethics, skillful, three, speech, four, action, and five, livelihood. Meditation, skillful, six, effort, seven, mindfulness, and eight, concentration. Having outlined the practical and technical aspects of the four foundations above, we will now look at how sati mindfulness can assume different modes of operating within them. In recent years, there has been a lot of academic study and deep investigation into the early Buddhist texts. Buddhist scholar Rupert Gethin has explored the entire Pali Canon and analyzed all the ways the term sati or mindfulness is used. Gethin found that the role of sati can be reduced to four particular applications. Simple awareness, protective awareness, introspective awareness, and deliberately forming conceptions. This analysis can also be found and explored further in a body of work entitled Mindfulness in Early Buddhism by Sifu Kwan, which was released through the Oxford School of Buddhism in 2011. Simple Awareness Simple awareness is what SM has called bare attention. The application of simple awareness is the ability to focus and concentrate by intentionally applying the faculty of attention toward a particular object. In most cases, this begins by applying attention to the process of breathing. So we have the faculty of attention intentionally applied toward the object of breathing. This is to be done in a loose and simple way. It is about simply knowing that you are breathing and staying with that process as best as you are able, finding a balanced effort that is appropriate for you. Within this practice of simple awareness, sati mindfulness is the conscious registering of the presence of objects, which can be any incoming sensory information or experience. Whether during meditation or in normal daily activities, this application can be active in our experience. It is the quality of the object being known. In many cases, it is described as contemplation of breathing, sounds, senses, and any other sensory or mind object thought. Simple awareness is best cultivated within the practice of the first foundation of mindfulness, body sensations, and the first noble truth. Simple awareness also implies the role of a kind and friendly attitude toward the stress of the body. The intent is to apply simple awareness toward the body and its sense gates, acknowledging any stress that may be present, while meeting that with a kind and friendly attitude. Protective Awareness The next application of sati mindfulness involves the ability to develop protective awareness to guard and protect the mind. As we develop the ability to perceive incoming sensory information, we can become increasingly aware of how the mind reacts to the object. We may be inclined to do something with whatever object is being registered. In this instance, sati is again typically related to the restraint of the senses and requires ethical judgment. The ability to perform protective awareness is impossible unless it is preceded by simple awareness. Protective awareness is best applied within the practice of the second foundation of mindfulness, feeling, impressions, and oriented toward the arising of craving and reactivity. As we have already pointed out, we crave the pleasant, we avoid the unpleasant, and we are often confused or disinterested by the neutral. By intentionally installing protective awareness at the moment of contact and feeling, we are able to intervene in the arising of craving. Protective awareness guards the mind from being influenced and corrupted by the mental factors of greed, hatred, and delusion. Protective awareness also contains the ethical and intentional qualities of compassion and appreciation, extending them as a protective mode of operation when appropriate. 
introspective awareness. The third application of sati mindfulness is the ability to develop introspective awareness, the ability to look into the mind itself. This serves as a backup measure when protective awareness fails. Its function is to identify unethical mind states and begin to discern what may be done to remove and overcome them. Mindfulness is utilized to notice unwholesome mind states and take measures to overcome them. The role of introspective awareness is best installed and applied when the third foundation of mindfulness, mind attitudes. By achieving this task, we can begin to experience the third noble truth, the release of reactivity and suffering. Introspective awareness also refines our abilities to respond with ethical qualities. Introspective awareness knows to meet pain with compassion, pleasure with appreciation, and can rest in the experience of kind friendliness in neutral states, thus allowing for the experience of equanimity to arise. Deliberately Forming Conceptions This application of sati mindfulness is about cultivating positive and wholesome intentions by reflecting on a wide range of experience. To some extent, the role of this particular aspect of sati mindfulness is the proper use and activation of thinking. When learning mindfulness practices, sometimes we get the sense that thinking is wrong or not allowed. This is a serious misunderstanding. Thinking actually plays a critical role in the process of liberation from suffering. Using thinking and our cognitive functions to encourage liberation is possible, but it must be learned. It consists of the wholesome functioning of perception. In some ways, it is about reorganizing the aggregates and mental factors in a proper way. We monitor our relationship to feeling states, which allows perception to see things more clearly and thus give rise to skillful and ethical intentions to overcome our habitual impulses. We continue to develop careful attention and are skillful about what objects we make contact with. Deliberately forming conceptions is based on constructive recognition, contemplation, and has four components. Number one, forming, inspiring, wholesome, and ethical concepts. Number two, recognition of what is ethically skillful or ethically unskillful. Number three, developing loving kindness and empathy towards self and other. Number four, reflection on the reality of death. Forming, inspiring, and wholesome ethical concepts is often associated with what is traditionally called wise reflection. It is considering and reflecting on good things that we have done, as well as things others have done for us. It allows us to develop and consider the cultivation of ethical intentions. We can activate this particular aspect of sati mindfulness before we speak or act. It plays a key role in the development of clear comprehension. It will have beneficial consequences if and when it is applied to the world of thoughts. Recognition of what is ethically skillful or unskillful functions as an antidote to greed, hatred, and delusion. We overcome these strong forces of mind by considering how we can be generous, kind, and understanding. This aspect of sati mindfulness also suggests that we continue to pay careful attention to all factors of the Eightfold Path. Specifically, we want to remember to be skillful and ethical around with our words, actions, and how we make our living. Developing loving kindness and empathy towards self and others includes the entirety of metta practices within the meditative experience. It is common to use phrases as an entry point into the heart. Here we use phrases, thoughts, concepts, and images that inspire these qualities of metta. Namely, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, appreciation, and equanimity. Much benefit will come if we are able to incorporate these qualities into our thoughts. More will be said on this in the chapter on heart practices. As mentioned earlier, within the practice of the body, an emphasis is placed on reflecting and acknowledging the reality of death. This is not meant to be a morbid reflection that leads to depression and remorse, If we can reflect on the certainty of death and the uncertainty of the time we have in this life, it may inspire us to live our lives in more meaningful ways. It may help us overcome our fear of death. 
If we consider that we actually won't survive, we may be able to make positive changes in our lives and in this world. Chapter 5 Ethical Mindfulness and the Role of Emotions When I first began teaching mindfulness practice, I was working closely with teenagers in an inpatient addiction treatment program. Many of the teens that I worked with had struggled, not only with drug addiction, but also with some of the mainstream learning modalities. Some of them had mild or severe learning disabilities, and most were overdiagnosed, as is often the case. Many of them had never been introduced to the idea of emotional intelligence. It was common for them to have low self-esteem, and many had experienced some form of physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, and presented with symptoms of PTSD. As is common with adolescents in addiction treatment programs, the substance abuse was really a secondary issue. My role was to provide daily education groups ranging from addiction education, relapse prevention, and community building exercises to the philosophies of spirituality that are at the core of 12-step programs. One of my many challenges was to teach these ideas in a way that was accessible for the teens. Ideally, my lessons and instructions would be pragmatic and therefore easy to understand and apply. As I began to write curriculum and develop simple handouts, I had to use everyday language to convey the messages I was offering. Not only did my ideas need to be simple, they also needed to be interesting. In fact, the hardest part of leading these types of groups was holding the teens' interest and attention so that they would be willing to participate. One thing that became clear was that attention follows interest, not the other way around. This realization presented me with a daily challenge. I had to continually balance between following the clinical milieu of the program in which I worked and creatively finding ways to keep the groups interesting for the teens. One of the many wonderful byproducts of this was that it allowed me, or really forced me, to develop an ongoing sense of empathy toward the teens. I became very interested in what they were interested in. We started to explore a wider range of ideas and often had meaningful conversations about things beyond typical addiction, education, treatment groups. Over time, everyone became more and more engaged and I began expanding on the topics and approaches that I knew worked well, changing and altering the material to be as meaningful and effective as possible. As I did this, a common theme that ran through most of the groups began to emerge the need to talk and share about our emotional life. This presents a paradox when working with youth because it is among the hardest topics to crack open, especially when you feel the resistance in the room. However, once the floodgates open and there is a space that feels safe enough for teens to share, it can be hard to get them to stop talking. It's the last thing and yet the first thing they want to discuss. Teens crave authenticity. There is no one on the planet that has a stronger bullshit detector than the American teenager. Whether they knew it or not, these teens in my program were becoming quite skilled at talking about the role of emotions in their lives and began to relate to each other with emotional authenticity and vulnerability within group process. At some point in the process, the therapeutic treatment team urged my staff and I to develop more written materials and curriculum on the topic of emotions. My first attempt was to come up with a very basic definition for the term emotions, so that we could have a simple way of discussing them. As I noted earlier, we tend to use the terms emotions and feelings interchangeably. But emotions are much more complex and have far-reaching consequences when they are suppressed, repressed, and misunderstood. In fact, it may be safe to say that emotions color every aspect and factor of consciousness which makes them very difficult to locate, access, and ultimately manage. So I decided instead to come up with a, as complicated a definition as I could for the term emotion. This seemed to me to be more helpful by avoiding the tendency to simplify a complex system. I also pointed out to the teens that our education system is largely focused on the external world of history, math, science, social studies, government, economics, and so forth. 
One of the ongoing conversations I had with those teens and continue to have with the teens I currently work with centers around the simple question, why do we know so little about our inner world? In coming up with a definition for emotions that I could use as a premise for weekly groups, my hope was to acknowledge, in a very real way, the complex and subtle nature of emotions. An emotion can be defined as a mental state that arises spontaneously rather than through conscious intent and is accompanied by physiological changes. The word emotion dates back to the late 1500s when it was adapted from the French term émouvoir, which literally means to stir up. As we investigate the worlds of psychology and philosophy, we learn that emotion is used as the generic term for subjective, conscious experience that is characterized primarily by psychological, biological, and physiological reactions that arise as mental states. Emotions are considered to have influence over attitude, intention, mood, temperament, personality, and disposition. Emotions also affect themselves. That is to say, emotion affects emotion. Emotions arise automatically and are understood to be the primary driving force behind behavior, both positive and negative. The physiology of emotion is closely linked to arousal of the nervous system. It may appear that people acting on emotion are not thinking, but cognition is an important aspect of emotion, particularly the interpretation of events. Emotion has a significant effect on what and how we remember. Emotions are brief in duration and consist of a coordinated set of responses, which may include verbal, physiological, behavioral, social, and neural mechanisms. Emotions are among the most complicated aspects of the human experience, and it is no surprise that we all struggle in some capacity with our emotional experience. By helping teens understand that emotions play a critical role in the human system of experience, it became much easier for them to engage in a meaningful dialogue about how they struggle with their own emotional experience. Discussing emotions from an objective point of view made it much easier for these teens to begin to dialogue about some of the challenges in their lives, and frequently for the first time. Over the last several years, the majority of my work and teaching has taken place in similar environments, working with both teens and adults in addiction treatment programs. Attempting to teach people with high levels of anxiety and toxic stress is always a challenge. The task is even greater when you find yourself limited to teaching strictly from a secular mindfulness, SM, platform with no real emphasis on ethics or basic Buddhist principles. I have found without a doubt the practices of mindfulness are better received and have a greater positive consequence when emphasis is placed on the ethics of non-harming. Some years later, I found myself in an ideal situation, working at a high-end intensive outpatient facility that also offered sober living to adult women and men. The program's primary focus was addiction, but we also worked with individuals with trauma, PTSD, and eating disorders. Working in that environment and the wide range of issues with which people were struggling required a wide range of skills. One of the many challenges of being a Buddhist-informed mindfulness instructor in the U.S. South is that most programs are not willing to allow you to teach the full range of mindfulness practices. This being the case, most of what I have taught during my time in the South has been rooted in the concepts and applications of SM. However, subsequently, the appropriately named Integrative Life Center hired me specifically to teach the full range of mindfulness practice as it's outlined in early Buddhism. This allowed me to discuss the basics of Buddhist psychology, outline the role of the Four Noble Truths, ethics, heart practices, karma, and much more. I was able to introduce various Buddhist recovery models, and recently I began offering groups and classes from Noah Levine's latest work entitled Refuge Recovery. Besides being a lot of fun for me, This allowed participants to address and work with much deeper parts of the human experience beyond attention training. Holding these groups within an ethically intentioned framework provided fertile ground for vulnerability, honesty, transparency, and authenticity for both facilitator and clients. 
It helped people to understand not only the what and how of the meditative experience, it provided solid, pragmatic arguments for the troubling question of why we would even want to do it in the first place and identify some of the immediate and long-term benefits we can expect. Balancing the cognitive and ethical skill sets in an informed treatment setting proved to be a most effective strategy. One thing that stands out is that most people I've worked with reported that learning the heart practices of kindness, friendliness, basic goodness was what really began to positively turn things around for them. I've heard people say that the dry mindfulness practices were helpful at the beginning, but they weren't able to sustain them without developing an ethical framework. Over the several thousand classes I have taught over the last five years, it has become apparent that once the ethical component is put into effect, the cognitive skills come much more easily. This is especially true in populations where the level of stress and suffering is above average. But I've also observed this in the classes I have taught to the general public at colleges, universities, and public libraries. Mindfulness programs with any population may be significantly limited in their capacity to facilitate real transformation and personal growth without some emphasis on ethics and non-harming. It's time that we reevaluate how mindfulness programs are being implemented and create a framework that emphasizes the need to balance ethical skills with cognitive skills. Ethical mindfulness may well be the appropriate balance of the two schools of classical mindfulness. CM, and Secular Mindfulness, SM. By acknowledging and being honest about the core teachings found within early Buddhism, we are better able to see that stress and suffering are part of our lives, and that we need to develop empathy and care. We are able to develop a sense of conscious concern for ourselves and for others. We are able to have more clarity in the causes of what troubles us, our suffering. We can learn to become less reactive and become more able to respond to that which we experience as unpleasant in all its forms. We gain confidence and a sense of trust in our ability to alleviate the challenges and difficulties that we face. We may even find that we start to shape a lifestyle that supports us in this process. We can develop a wide range of skills that lead to true well-being and a newfound freedom that is independent of external gain, status, pleasure, and praise. The awareness of mind becomes wider and wider as the heart becomes softer and better able to hold that which is painful. We can develop a careful attention in many more moments of our lives than we had previously thought, thus creating a deeper sense of presence. We can learn to live well. Chapter 6. Emotional Intelligence What is emotional intelligence? As I noted earlier, one of the many byproducts of mindfulness practice is the ability to understand the world of emotions and how they operate in the human system. Sustained mindfulness practice allows individuals to develop emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence, EI, is the process of learning how to identify, assess, and manage the full range of human emotions. Many people struggle with emotional stress in the forms of emotional reactivity and dysregulation. Many people have limited ability in managing emotions. EI is a set of skills and tools that can be utilized in formal mindfulness practice, as well as the day-to-day -day events of our busy lives. By employing the concentrative and attention retraining aspects of mindfulness, individuals can gain a better access into the nature of their own emotions. Once we are able to respond to the world of emotions with an attitude of ethics and non-harming, our emotional life begins to improve and emotional intelligence can become an ongoing practice of self-inquiry and emotional therapy. It provides a framework and resources that empowers us to manage our own emotions. EI is most commonly outlined by a four-stage model. Within this model, each skill builds on the previous one. We begin by applying mindfulness practice as the baseline for developing the four stages of number one, identifying and perceiving emotions, number two, accessing and embodying emotions, number three, 
understanding emotions, and number four, managing emotions. We will go through each of these stages and consider how these practices can be put into effect by emphasizing a pragmatic approach. The first step in the process is the ability to identify an emotion. Because emotions are wide in their range and we have many terms to describe them, it's best to keep our approach as simple as possible. The best strategy I have found to learn how to identify an emotion is to use the mindfulness application of feeling. Because feeling is so narrowly defined within early Buddhism, it gives us an easy portal to enter the emotional domain. We simply acknowledge the emotion to be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. This allows us to begin to access the emotion. We use this mindfulness tool to feel into the emotion and to know the effective quality or valence of the emotion. By naming it as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, we are put into position to be able to see how and where the emotion is perceived. We might ask the question, where in the body does this emotion appear? Emotions will typically show up in specific locations within the felt sense of the body experience. We can begin using basic mindfulness of the body to notice where we experience the emotion and where it shows itself in the form of sensation. We might find that certain emotions will typically show up in the front of the throat, the face, the torso, or the inside of the arms and legs. We bring mindfulness to the feeling quality of the emotion and learn to rest into it. If we apply mindfulness of breathing to that particular aspect of the emotion, we will find that we can regulate that emotional state. Even if for a brief period of time we are learning the basics of self-tolerance. From the direct experience of mindfulness practice, this would still require that we are able to ignore the mental contents associated with the emotion. At this stage of emotional intelligence practice, we are just accessing the felt sense of the emotion and using the mind to simply know it as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. We may notice that the emotion will pass or shift within the body. We may find emotions to be challenging or difficult to hold. But if we can breathe through them, we may find they are a lot easier to face than we initially thought. If we are able to learn this first set of skills, we can begin to foster the second stage, the ability to access and embody the emotion. Once the emotion is perceived and identified within the body, and we have developed some degree of tolerance toward it, we are able to really gain access to the emotion. We find that we have more ease with the emotion simply by allowing it to be held. We often get physically tight and contract around emotions, which only makes the experience more unpleasant. If we are able to relax the body and breath, our ease with more challenging emotions will increase over time. Developing a relaxed and simple mindful awareness of breath and body actually creates the conditions for emotional regulation. We come to know emotions as being sensations in the body and the impressions they create, progressively becoming more able to access our emotional life with skill and ease. Within mindfulness, we may be aware of some of the mental contents, thoughts, or memories that are associated with a particular emotion. We can develop a larger vocabulary for our emotions. We can see that unpleasant emotions are usually some form of anger, fear, or sadness. On the contrary, we may have joy, acceptance, and happiness. We can notice the difference between where and how such emotions show up. Having an ability to bring interest and care to the world of accessible emotions, we get a better glimpse into the cause and effect of how and what brings about the onset of a particular emotion. We are less likely to avoid, suppress, or react to emotions. The ability to gain this level of access to emotions is no small victory for many people, and our ability to do so will depend greatly on how much time and effort we put into a daily sitting meditation practice. In fact, the first two stages of EI are directly correlated to the development of mindfulness skills. It's also equally important to add that having an attitude of non-harming toward unpleasant emotions will greatly increase our ability to access them. Understanding emotions is the third stage of EI and draws more heavily on our cognitive abilities. 
Once we can identify and access emotions, we can start to see the nature of how they operate in our system. We see that thinking actually plays a big role in how emotions are experienced and expressed. Emotions move. They are changing constantly and don't typically last for long periods of time. Of course, this is good news when we speak of sadness, loneliness, anger, and fear. However, when it comes to happiness, contentment, and joy, we would prefer to hold on to those emotions. When we start to experience the ever-changing rise and fall of emotions, they lose their ability to cause unnecessary suffering for us. If we allow the emotion into our direct experience, we find it passes through on its own. We need to acknowledge that emotions are often stressful in nature. No matter how hard we try and how many good choices we make, life will continue to present us with difficult and challenging emotional experiences. We often suffer around emotions because we are unable to accept the stress and affliction we experience in connection with them. We get caught up in reactivity. We resist and push away, and often have feelings of hatred and ill will toward the emotions that we experience. And we suffer. Again, this is why the role of ethics plays such a tremendous role in our ability to relate to emotions in a helpful way. Being able to respond to difficult emotions with empathy and kindness is at the core of ethical mindfulness. One of the ways that we internalize afflictive emotions is by taking them personally and creating a story or narrative around why we feel the emotion. We may think that we should or shouldn't feel a particular emotion and that there may be something wrong with us. Working with emotions is extremely counterintuitive. It is for precisely this reason we need to have solid and fine-tuned skills around the ability to identify and access emotions. Developing basic mindfulness skills and building a daily practice will be our best ally when it comes to the cultivation of emotional intelligence. Managing emotions is the final stage of EI. This is a lifelong exercise. There are many therapeutic practices within both Western psychology and mindfulness that can help us. Three particular skills will improve our ability to manage emotions. Being able to choose what you becoming emotional about and when. Being able to choose how you act and when you become emotional. And being able to create the gap between impulse and action. Chapter 7. Heart Practices. Cultivating Positive Emotions. What are heart practice meditations? Heart practices encompass a range of concepts, ethics, and actions found within the structures of early Buddhism that also connect with various models arising out of emotional intelligence, EI. Over the last decade or so, social emotional learning, SEL, Modalities teach a variety of skills and empathy to both children and adults. For many people, the development of empathy can be quite challenging due to a range of reasons. In many cases, the best way to approach empathy is seeing it as a set of skills that we can develop. Ultimately, we are talking about the ability to understand the world of emotions. In early Buddhism, these same ideas would be the practice and understanding of internal and external mindfulness. We can learn to understand the ways we are affected by our internal experiences of thoughts and emotions. We are often consumed by our memories and fears. We can learn to see how to react to our experience externally through words and behaviors. Our inner turmoil often manifests as external harm, which in turn leads us to regret. What we are aiming to do is learn how to substitute our habitual reactions with thoughtful responses. As Viktor Frankl has famously stated so many years ago, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Mindfulness helps to create and widen that space, and ethics teaches us how to respond appropriately. Developing this ability is not only in our best interest, it allows for positive change in this world. For the sake of keeping things simple, we will refer to these trainings as heart practices. These heart practices are the responsive aspect of ethical mindfulness. 
They are best cultivated within the mental faculty of intention. Anyone who is vaguely familiar with classical mindfulness, CM, practice, or has attended any insight retreats has likely been introduced to what are called metta practices and sometimes called the Brahma Viharas. The most common and well known definition of metta is loving kindness. Metta practices are divided into four particular sets. We incline the mind toward qualities that act as appropriate responses to the various and nuanced conditions that we face in our lives. Classically, these four sets are defined as loving kindness, metta, compassion, karuna, sympathetic joy, mudita, and equanimity, upeka. The word metta is derived from the Pali word mita. Mita literally means friend. I find the best translation of the term metta to be kind friendliness. Within the teachings of Buddhist psychology found within the Pali Canon, it is defined as follows. Metta has the mode of friendliness for its characteristic. Its natural function is to promote friendliness. It is manifested as the disappearance of ill will. Its footing is seeing with kindness. When it succeeds, it eliminates ill will. When it fails, it degenerates into greed, self-centered craving, and attachment. Translation, Bhikkhu Bodhi. The Buddhist tradition acknowledges that metta is inherent within the human experience. It is part of our essence, our true nature, and is sometimes called our Buddha nature. This natural quality of metta becomes covered up as we are affected and corrupted by the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion. So it is something that we need to rediscover, uncover, and recover. On the other hand, metta can also be cultivated. We can begin to use metta practices as a means for developing wholesome intentions. If we use the definition of the mind depicted in the earlier diagram, the qualities developed through metta practice would occur in the inclination, sankara, aggregate. Metta practices can be seen as a form of spiritual healing purifying and transforming habits and reactions by developing the appropriate intention. We can say that from the top end, we are digging down into the heart to uncover a heart quality that has always been there, and on the bottom end, we are developing or cultivating the same quality by setting forth the intention to do so. In early Buddhism, this would be known as the cultivation of sitta and the development of right intention, which is the second factor of the Eightfold Path. In the schema of this process, these intentional qualities are understood as the foundation that mindfulness practice is built upon. Meta practices are the building blocks that form and hold together the practice of ethical mindfulness. Below, I will outline the role and application of each of these four qualities, kind, friendliness, compassion, appreciation, and equanimity. Each and every one of these are known as meta practices, but each has a particular quality and role within the development of meta. Within the Pali formulas, these practices are known as meta bhavana. Today, they would most likely be translated as the cultivation of positive emotions. Kind friendliness, meta. Kind friendliness is the first foundation of meta practices. This is understood to be a beneficial attitude or quality in every situation. It is always appropriate. According to the Abhidharma, the teachings on Buddhist psychology, it is present in every moment where mindfulness occurs and strongly implied that the two cannot be separated. Metta is sometimes defined as non-hatred because it promotes the welfare of all living beings. It holds ease, peace, and contentment as a baseline attitude and promotes its increase. It has the ability to remove ill will. It is able to see the goodness in others as well as the self without being tempted toward blame or finding fault. It seeks to further cooperation and understanding even in the presence of difficulty. It can be seen as radical humility. Compassion, karuna. Compassion is the second aspect of heart practices and has the specific aim of being directed toward pain and suffering. It is often defined as a movement of the heart when we come into contact with pain and anguish. This definition also implies the same quality when we face our own suffering. 
It is the motivation and willingness to alleviate the suffering of others and ourselves through any means we have. As a quality of mind, it is only appropriate and necessary during moments of distress, sadness, pain, or suffering. It simply intends to help or hold that which hurts. However, compassion is also an action, an ethic, primarily characterized as promoting the removal of suffering in others and of oneself. With compassion comes the inability to express hatred. Its expression is the manifestation of nonviolence. It has the ability to uproot the intention to cause harm. It can be brought about by seeing and understanding the difficulties and pains of others while holding a sincere desire to alleviate such suffering. It succeeds when it causes violence and ill will to descend. It fails when it produces depression and sorrow. Compassion isn't self-pity or pity for others, but when wrongly understood it may manifest in this way. It's ultimately about feeling one's own pain and recognizing the pain of others. When we can see and experience the suffering of this world that we are all subject to, we may become kinder and more compassionate to one another. As a practice, it may be understood as the cultivation of empathy that includes the cultivation and practice of forgiveness. Because compassion and forgiveness have specific and important differences, it's best to separate the two. While at the same time we may want to acknowledge that they both fall under the same general heading of compassion, karuna, compassion can be very challenging because it is always going up against pain, which we instinctually want to avoid. Compassion may be accompanied by a sense of heaviness and may carry a weight that can be hard to hold. Therefore, it needs to be as an ongoing practice. The synonym that we commonly use for compassion is empathy. Here, we may need to distinguish empathy from sympathy. The quality of empathy emphasizes an interest in and ability to understand and access the emotional states of another person, to feel with him or her. We have the ability to hold his or her pain or sadness in a way that creates a connection. Sympathy is commonly expressed as a feeling or attitude of having pity or feeling sorry for somebody else's pain. Both qualities acknowledge and identify that pain is present, but empathy is able to hold the pain and sympathy is not. Sympathy creates an experience of disconnect and can sometimes be experienced as patronizing or condescending for the person on its receiving end. It is important to acknowledge that empathy is more than a concept that we value. It is a skill learned through the practice that requires maintenance. There are three types of empathy that we can develop, cognitive, emotional, and compassionate. Cognitive empathy is the ability to recognize the emotional state of another person. This requires the development of external mindfulness. Most of us have it. It is simply the ability to observe and discern how another person may be feeling by a wide range of cues that would include facial expressions, body language, tone of voice, and overall effect. However, just because we know how someone else is feeling doesn't mean that we actually care about it. In some instances, this type of empathy may be even used to manipulate another person to get them to do what we want. So, although cognitive empathy is a prerequisite to develop the other types, in and of itself, it is limited. It's what we do with cognitive empathy that matters. How we apply ethics to our cognitive empathy is a whole other set of skills. Emotional empathy is the ability to feel the emotional state of the other person. This is a skill that many of us also have, though some more than others. Emotional empathy is very important, but it can also burn us out if we can't manage it properly. Many people working in the fields of addiction treatment and behavioral health experience compassion fatigue syndrome because their abilities of emotional empathy are strong but unmanageable. In some cases, such people become codependent. We can be so attuned to and concerned about the emotional states of others that we ignore our own. Emotional empathy is a wonderful and beneficial skill when we are able to manage it properly. The best strategy for this is to develop the third and final type of empathy, compassion. Compassion is the ability to both feel and to respond in a way that reduces or holds the suffering of another. Within the context of empathy, 
Compassion is our greatest skill. It is also a skill that we need to learn and maintain through practice. Compassion is an ethical action that motivates us to respond to and help alleviate suffering. However, for compassion to function properly, we need to be skilled in both cognitive and emotional empathy. Forgiveness. There is no official Pali translation for the word forgiveness that I have come across, but the idea of forgiveness is expressed wholeheartedly through the teachings. For that reason, I find that it is best to include it within the cultivation of the heart practice of compassion. Forgiveness practice plays a critical role in the development of compassion and empathy because if we can't forgive, we limit our ability for true connection and empathy. Forgiveness is the antidote to resentment. It allows us to learn how to put aside and ultimately abandon our tendency toward blaming. There is no lasting sense of well-being or happiness associated with the common and often seemingly justified habit of finding fault in others. The internal manifestations of blaming ourselves are guilt, shame, and remorse. Of course, At times, it will be important for us to acknowledge the harm we have caused, and it is helpful to experience an appropriate amount of regret, but at some point, we need to forgive ourselves for our past actions. In fact, forgiveness is the most effective strategy when it comes to simply letting go. Understanding that blaming is only a source of harm to others and ourselves, we set the intention to hold forgiveness as quality that we aim to embody. Working with and practicing forgiveness happens on three levels. We consider asking forgiveness for the harm we have caused others, we forgive ourselves, and then we offer forgiveness for those who have harmed us. While the order in which we do these practices isn't that important, but we may want to begin with the forgiveness process as soon as possible. Sometimes when people start the forgiveness practice, they go after the biggest and most harmful resentment of their lives first. This is not the best strategy. It is typically encouraged to start with forgiving in ways that are smaller and more manageable, and then move into more challenging territories as we gain confidence and fluency with the process. I suggest, as many other teachers also do, that we start by asking for forgiveness for the harm we have caused others. This is a good place to start because we may find that we are carrying some regret and guilt related to the people we have hurt. Acknowledging this truth will often inspire and encourage us to begin because we so deeply desire to be free from the burdens that we carry about the past harms we have caused. We may begin by imagining what it would be like to let go and be free from this type of suffering. After practicing this for some time, we want to begin the process of forgiving ourselves. Self-forgiveness is one of the best practices to overcome our regrets, our guilt, and any shame that we may be carrying about who we think we are. For many people, this is the most challenging of all three, which is why I suggest that it go in the middle. We may find that our present-time depression and low self-esteem is directly tied to our inability to forgive ourselves. When the past has been painful and we feel responsible for it, we often carry the past over and over again into our present. Sometimes this kind of suffering is so familiar to us that we don't have any insight into its true nature. If we can muster the willingness and courage to turn toward our past and begin to forgive ourselves, much will be revealed. It will shine a light onto some of the deepest patterns of the harm we cause to ourselves. In many ways, it is the true practice of freedom and is a key factor within the development of ethical mindfulness. Once we begin to feel the relief that comes when we are able to learn and access forgiveness, it is much easier to begin to forgive others for the harm they have caused us. That being said, it is important to be clear that certain actions are absolutely unforgivable. Here, we find benefit by separating the action from the actor. We are forgiving the person, not the act. Appreciation. Mudita. The most common translation for mudita is sympathetic joy. This encourages us to be able to sympathize with or participate in the happiness of others. It is also the antidote to jealousy and envy. I prefer to use the term appreciation because it has a much more common meaning to us. I have never even heard somebody use the term sympathetic joy outside of a formal Buddhist context. 
Mudita has the ability and characteristic of gladdening. It helps us to overcome the common attitude of how come them and not me. We may find that we often become jealous or self-conscious when we are faced with the good fortune of others. This creates the experience of separation and we become disconnected and self-centered. We may consider how unfortunate it is to be unable to practice in the happiness and success of others, especially when the person is somebody we really care about. Whether it is a good friend, colleague, or family member, wouldn't we want to be able to appreciate his or her good fortune? We want to develop a specific practice to evoke and embody this quality of appreciation. Such a practice gives us the ability to participate in all the happiness, joy, success, and pleasure of this world without the need for it to be our own. If we restrict our experience of gratitude to our own gains and successes, we severely limit our potential joy and happiness. We create a mind that compares and contrasts. We may become competitive, bitter, and even resentful. If we can bring awareness and appreciation to the good fortune of others, it allows us to keep from closing off from the world and revel in happiness and connection. Equanimity, Upaka. Equanimity is the practice that holds everything together. We simply acknowledge the truth that our happiness and our freedom is dependent on our actions, not on our wishes. Equanimity balances compassion with wisdom. It allows us to experience the full range of ethical mindfulness. Chapter 8. Ethical Mindfulness In our common everyday usage, the term ethical has a wide range of meanings and applications. It spans from its historical roots in philosophy all the way through medicine, science, psychotherapy, education, and business. The most basic understanding of the term ethical usually centers on what is right and wrong and implies a sense of morality. Human society has been discussing and debating the idea of ethics for centuries. My intention is to offer a clear definition that can have practical and meaningful implications for our current framework of mindfulness practice within mainstream culture. In the context of mindfulness, ethical refers to the development and maintenance of intentions that hold non-harming of self and others as a core foundational value. As we trace the word back to its Greek roots, we find the term ethos. Ethos is defined as the fundamental values particular to a specific movement or culture, in this case, the mindfulness movement. The harm and suffering that is created within the context of the human mind can appear endless, and perhaps it is. We find ourselves in a world with epidemic anxiety, depression, mental disorders, addiction, trauma, and record high levels of stress and emotional burnout. Addiction to alcohol and other drugs, food, sex, pornography, and digital stimulation is rampant. The need for practices that hold non-harming as a core value is overwhelmingly obvious and without significant remedy. As mindfulness practice and mindfulness-based interventions reach a wider and more challenging audience, the need for adaptability is essential. As it is understood and practiced in the U.S., mindfulness is at a crucial crossroads and is in need of a systems update if it is to have lasting positive consequences for all who encounter it. A key question to consider and continue to ask ourselves is, who is in the room? In other words, who is the audience? Should the varieties of mindfulness practice be as wide, if not wider, than the range of people to which we are teaching it? The mental faculty of attention is developed in all forms of mindfulness practice, yet the role of ethical intention is often left by the wayside. It seems to be what John Kabat-Zinn is pointing to when he says, on purpose and in a particular way. Although I find this to be a rather clumsy way of expressing what could easily be called intention. In the early Buddhist texts, in many places we find the term Yoniso Manasakaro, the most common translation being wise attention. But as we take a further look into this curious term, what we may come to understand is that it more accurately translates as careful intention, which implies empathy. The definition offers us a twofold way of approaching its meaning and application. 
The first suggests that we be careful to what it is we are paying attention to. The second implies that we might benefit by extending a quality of kindness and empathy to what is being attended to. We develop the ability to attend with care and interest, to be able to empathize with the circumstances and conditions of our experience, here and now. What we are looking at is the intentional development of careful attention. This is the root skill of ethical mindfulness, EM. As I stated earlier, the ethical quality of non-harming is best cultivated within the mental faculty of intention. This is the core foundational idea where the practice begins, the development and cultivation of intention. What the early Buddhist tradition points to is the need to be clear and to be mindful of what our intentions are. The obvious invitation here is to hold non-harming as a core value and begin to live and practice from that place, while at the same time acknowledging that we may not always measure up and that's okay. We all make mistakes and often do things we regret, so there needs to be room for kindness and humility in the process. We begin to learn how to modify our thoughts and actions through this perspective. The practice of ethical mindfulness provides the necessary tools to do this. We acknowledge all the ways suffering is created when we cause intentional harm. We develop self-honesty and clarity around the difficulties in our lives. We can learn to be honest and clear about all the ways harm is caused within our own inner landscape. In early Buddhist practice, this understanding would be called right view, the first factor of the Eightfold Path. It involves understanding the laws of cause and effect related to suffering. When we cause harm, we suffer. When we experience harm, we may become vengeful and resentful, and we suffer. Early Buddhism offers five basic trainings that help us frame a lifestyle that not only leads to non-harming, but also offers fertile ground for cultivating a long-lasting sense of well-being and connection with others and with the world in which we live. Many secular mindfulness programs have historically tended to avoid discussing these five training practices. The tendency is to dismiss them as rules that are somehow bound to an idea of Buddhist religiosity that has little value in our modern secular society. However, these training practices provide the ethical framework that allows mindfulness to transform our lives toward well-being and happiness. Number one, our intention is to not cause harm to any living beings. This means making a commitment to protect life and to respect the virtue of treating all beings with kindness and compassion. We all experience moments of anger, ill will, and resentment. This is a natural aspect of the human experience. When confronted by these internal forces, we tend toward blame, finding fault, and scapegoating. We often think of ways to take revenge or find justice. When we fail to understand these habits and are unable to move beyond their grip, we cause harm unto others. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it may not be. Either way, harm is caused. These reactions usually result from our own inability to hold the pain, sadness, or disappointment from the harm we experience. And then, when we push back and act out on our pain, we typically get caught up in guilt, regret, remorse, and shame, especially when we cause harm to those people who are closest to us. When we become unable to resolve those internal forces, we re-engage by justifying or rationalizing the harm we created. We often lose the ability to take responsibility for our actions by focusing on another. It becomes a vicious cycle where we become both the victim and perpetrator. This is an opportunity for us to begin to set friendliness and kindness as the bar. If and when we fail, and we will, or when we find that others don't measure up, we can learn to extend forgiveness and compassion by seeing that we all struggle in this way. One of the current ways we can begin to understand empathy is by using a simple rhyme of just like me. We can understand the reality that others get hurt and make the mistakes of causing harm, just like me. It can begin to give us the humility to understand the human experience. The practice of ethical mindfulness suggests that we learn to protect life by not causing harm to self or others. Number two, 
Our intention is to refrain from taking things that are not freely offered. This suggests that we avoid stealing, which implies honesty, respect for the possession of others, and concern for the natural environment. The destruction we see on a global scale as the result of the greed around taking and exploiting resources is tragic. If we look at our lives, we might ask the question, in what ways do I try to acquire things that are not freely offered? How do I use deception, manipulation, and rationalization in my attempts to acquire things? In what ways do we justify our use of resources, energy, and other people for our own benefit? We may see that our capitalistic free market system is loaded with various and deceptive ways to take advantage of people and resources. In what ways do we look the other way? How do we participate in things that go against our better judgment or core values? When answering such questions, we may find that we participate in various forms of carelessness and denial. In turn, we may even have a sense of regret about some of the harm that we have caused through our lack of interest in or inability to be mindful in precisely this way. A more ethical perspective points us toward taking more responsibility for our use of information and resources, including other people's time and attention. On the flip side, what we are talking about is the need for some type of renunciation. Where can we let go of and or reduce taking, acquiring, and having? Can we put aside our wants for a time and pay attention to what we actually need? Can we break our addiction to consuming? Can we learn to live with less? How can we become interested or more interested in doing so? If the interest is there, how do we act on it and begin to follow through? When do we start and what are we waiting for? My favorite definition of the term renunciation is not needing anything extra. It is being content with what we have, the ability to be easily satisfied. This may even imply developing some gratitude for what we do have. As a mindfulness practice, this may encourage and challenge us to take a bigger view of things. As we learn to sit still and be with what is offered in the passing moments of our lives and meditation practice, we can apply that same mode of operating toward the rest of our lives. In meditation, we can break the addiction to thinking and wanting. In turn, we see we can live with less, which allows for a deeper sense of ease and contentment. The practice of ethical mindfulness suggests don't take or attempt to take things, resources, or people's energy when these things are not freely offered. We make a commitment to not cause harm by respecting that which is not ours. Number three, our intention is to be truthful and authentic with all our communication. This suggests that we are committed to honesty. This is one of the biggest challenges and an area in our lives where we have tremendous opportunity to practice. So much of our daily life involves some form of communication. In the modern world, we have an increasingly wide range of ways in which we communicate. We are caught up in the busy world of texting, emailing, and social media. In fact, it may be safe to say that talking face-to-face is becoming a lost art. If we begin to unpack and deconstruct all the ways communication can cause harm in our lives, we start to experience the practice of mindfulness in a more relational way. This gives us a more integrative view into how we relate to others. Previously, we may not have noticed if we are a type of person who prefers to listen or to talk. Do we actually hear what the other person is saying? Or are we rehearsing in our head for our next turn to speak? Do we overpower others with our speech? Are we hard on ourselves and easy on others or vice versa? Do we check our emails and texts compulsively? Do we feel anxious and preoccupied waiting for the next digital response? Do we feel comfortable and at ease in moments of silence? Or do we feel the need to fill that space with talking or other forms of endless chatter? Can you even sit silently and enjoy moments of stillness alone or with yourself or with others? How do you feel right now even considering these questions? There are other important questions to look at as well. How do we receive communication? Do we take what other people say too personally? Are we too reactive? Do we stand up for ourselves or do we back down and maybe find that we are too forgiving? How do we experience harm as a result of what we are told? In what ways do we seek attention through communication? How addicted are you to checking your phone for an email or a text message? 
What is your relationship to social media? Do you find yourself getting pissed off at Facebook posts? Were some of the more painful experiences of your life things that people said to you or said about you? When do we ask ourselves the difficult question of how do we answer them? When do we bring mindfulness to our world of communication? When do we stand up against all the harm that is created in the realm of human communication? At one point or another, everyone has been lied to, taken advantage of, manipulated, deceived, and put down. Perhaps we were ignored and nobody said anything to us. Maybe we had to figure things out on our own, believing that what was said or wasn't didn't even matter. We might reflect on the harm that we have experienced as a result of communication and decide to consider making some changes. We might start right away. How do we offer communication? How do we treat others with our speech? What is your relationship with talking to others? Are you kind and friendly all the time? Do you find yourself pressured to be nice but don't really mean it? Does your friendliness sometimes feel inauthentic? Do we always tell the truth? For what reasons do we lie? Are we really that concerned with what other people think of us? Or are we really only concerned with what certain people think of us? In this area of investigation, early Buddhism offers us some helpful suggestions. There are five specific questions we can ask ourselves and perhaps start to include into our daily practice of communication. Is what I am about to say true? Is what I am about to say useful? Is what I am about to say coming from a place of kindness? Is now the appropriate time to have this conversation? Am I being authentic in my communication? Is what I am about to say true? Sometimes we answer questions or offer information without even considering if it is actually true. This may be intentional or not. Though honesty is a value that most people put into place as best they can, it is a challenging practice for many of us. We can reflect on the ways dishonesty has caused harm to others and to ourselves and start to err on the side of being honest. We learn to walk through the fear and vulnerability of what the truth might hold and begin to learn humility. By developing the ability to be truthful and transparent with people who are important to us, as well as ourselves, we learn how to be more authentic in our lives. This will provide the proper soil in which we can cultivate the types of relationships we have perhaps desired all along. Is what I'm about to say useful? We may consider all the ways that we communicate that are completely unnecessary. Sometimes we do this to fill awkward silences or because we want attention. At times we may feel inclined to point out the faults of others by offering unsolicited advice or feedback. We may want to consider what we say before we say it. Sometimes even the most well-intentioned forms of communication aren't received well. Using communication as a vehicle for cooperation rather than competition is at the heart of this suggestion. Is what I am about to say coming from a place of kindness? How can we be kind and friendly with our communication without being perceived as phony or contrived? Sometimes we may overcompensate by being too kind. Or we may demonstrate a type of brutal honesty that is received as harsh and divisive. How do we balance being truthful with kindness? Sometimes we have to say things that we know are not going to be taken so well. We find ourselves having to have difficult conversations quite often. We give people bad news and sometimes have to make or hold a strong boundary with somebody who continues to be a challenge for us. This area of communication comes down to the basic skill of learning to say what we mean without being mean when we say it. This requires skill and ongoing practice and will have far-reaching and long-lasting positive consequences when we can execute it properly. Is now the appropriate time to have this conversation? As with many things in life, the timing of communication is of the essence. In many cases, the success or failure of a conversation will rest on how well it is timed. We may want to avoid having difficult conversations if we are angry, frustrated, or tired. And likewise, if we notice this in others, we may want to table the conversation for a better time. 
This displays a sense of respect and empathy by creating an opportunity for permission rather than dragging somebody into a challenging conversation when the circumstances are not conducive to a positive outcome. This will also strengthen our ability to be more skillful and timely with words in general. Am I being authentic in my communication? Being authentic with our communication is one of the most effective ways to develop and maintain healthy and happy relationships. To be authentic takes courage. It also requires that we are able to be transparent and open about our suffering and all of the difficulties that we face. If we can find at least one other person to practice this with, we are very fortunate. Being transparent also allows us to experience vulnerability in a way that doesn't promote shame or fear, but promotes connection. The practice of ethical mindfulness suggests that we learn to become truthful and authentic with all forms of communication. We make a commitment to not cause intentional harm to others with our words, and we become willing to have conversations that challenge us. Number four, our intention is to not cause harm to others or ourselves with our sexuality. We abstain from misusing our sexual energy which implies treating others with respect and dignity. The suffering that is created and experienced in this world as a result of the misuse of sexual energy is overwhelming and tragic. Sexual desire is hardwired into our biological system, and we all struggle with it in one way or another. The Buddha himself is quoted to having said that if there were another energy as strong as sexuality, nobody, including himself, would ever be able to achieve liberation. I would argue that sexual energy is perhaps the number one cause of suffering for the human race. Everyone, everywhere, suffers about sex. Many of us who live within the safe confines of a modern American culture will most likely never experience starvation, war, homelessness, or many other types of suffering that we find in other parts of the world. However, I have yet to meet somebody who is unable to tell me a story of loss, sadness, or betrayal involving a sexual relationship of some sort. We suffer around too much sex, not enough sex, unwanted sex, and the wrong kind of sex. Many of us have been abused sexually, oppressed sexually, have experienced guilt, shame, and regret about the sexual experiences we have had or would like to have. For adults in the United States, It is more likely not that you have experienced some form of sexual abuse in your formative years. During my years working with teens in addiction treatment, over 70% of the girls that came through our program had been victims of sexual abuse. The suffering found within the global sex trade and trafficking industry is of tragic proportion. A recent online search indicated that the international sex trade alone is worth $32 billion annually. And this figure doesn't even include the pornography industry. Sex addiction in the form of viewing pornography and accessing prostitution is on the rise and more and more treatment programs to address it are opening around the nation. The paradox here is that for most of us, intimate sexual relationships are one of the greatest joys that we can experience in life. Yet it is also an area where we experience tremendous suffering. Here we can see with particular clarity the importance of ethics, integrity, responsibility, and an intention in not causing harm with our sexual energy. The practice of ethical mindfulness strongly suggests that we take full responsibility for our own sexual energy. We make a commitment to not cause intentional harm to others or ourselves with our sexuality. Number five, our intention is to refrain from all forms of alcohol and other recreational drugs. We aspire to cultivate the virtue of sobriety and being awake. We make a commitment to clarity of mind by not participating in alcohol and other drug use. Of the five ethical training practices, this one has been the most overlooked and underutilized by secular mindfulness communities and the greater insight meditation tradition here in the U.S. Opting to take a liberal view of this practice, many people hold the perspective that moderate use of alcohol and other recreational drugs is perfectly fine and appropriate. Unfortunately, this can give mixed messages to people who come to mindfulness practice. Many people have turned to Buddhist communities in an attempt to find support with addiction to alcohol and or other drugs, only to find that many members and teachers within these communities use alcohol and other drugs recreationally. 
This creates confusion and in some instances may cause harm to those hoping to find a safe refuge. As Noah Levine, Buddhist teacher and author of Dharma Punks and Refuge Recovery, a Buddhist path to recovery from addiction has put it, because the Buddha taught a middle way, we often understand his teaching to mean everything in moderation, but this is not what the Buddha taught. The middle way, referred to in the text, is a path that avoids extreme austerity and extreme gluttony. Abstaining from alcohol and other drugs is not an extreme austerity. The Buddhist precepts are clear about what we must abstain from, killing, lying, stealing, sexual misconduct, and intoxication. Nobody is saying it's okay to kill, lie, or steal in moderation, so why do we continue to rationalize the use of alcohol and other drugs? Without a doubt, the use of alcohol and other drugs pollutes the mind and affects our judgment. Trying to rationalize and undermine this training aspect only creates confusion. It may also promote irresponsibility and minimize the negative consequences of substance abuse in general. One of the key factors that we find with people who struggle with substance abuse is denial. Ironically, we sometimes see the very same issue playing out with the greater insight and mindfulness communities. The suggestion here is not to rationalize the use of substances, but to be transparent in acknowledging the reasons why we choose to engage with substances that cloud the mind and take full responsibility for that choice. Perhaps the use of substances may just be another strategy to manage underlying stress, or maybe it's seen as an attempt to have fun and create connection. Why is the use of substances necessary to create these experiences? Perhaps mindfulness practitioners would benefit greatly by taking a closer look at their relationship with alcohol and other drugs. The practice of ethical mindfulness strongly suggests that we take full responsibility for our relationship to substance use. We make a commitment to abstain from any form of intoxicants that cloud the mind. The commitment will only serve us well in our intention to not cause harm to others or ourselves by clouding our judgment with substances. After exploring these five training practices, we may imagine the type of world we would live in if more and more people began to hold these practices among their core values. Given the increasing interest in mindfulness, I suggest that these practices not be set aside as some form of Buddhist religiosity, but rather that they've been sincerely considered for inclusion in mindfulness-based programs. These training practices have a place at the forefront of the mindfulness movement and deserve a home within programming, education, milieu, and curricula. Toward the Development of Ethical Mindfulness Several years ago, I began teaching a mindfulness class in the local jail with a secular mindfulness organization called the Mind Body Awareness Project, MBA. The MBA has a long and successful history of providing mindfulness-based interventions to at-risk youth in the San Francisco Bay Area. I had participated in a mind-body awareness project training that provided the basic framework and modalities to operate a similar program with adult men and women. I had developed a professional relationship with the clinical director of the program, which operated through the Davidson County Sheriff's Office, DCSO, in Nashville, Tennessee. DCSO was interested in providing a variety of interventions to inmates serving time for drug-related crimes, and due to the success of mindfulness-based interventions such as CBT and DBT, they were looking for someone to provide formal mindfulness practices. I was brought in to teach weekly one-hour classes to both men and women as a contractor. I would roll up to the jail each week, go inside, see the attendant guard and get a laminated guest pass and go through a series of locked doors through two separate buildings before walking up a hill to enter into the woman's building where I would go through two more doors to a group treatment room. Depending on the conditions of the day, this process would take anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. Part of my agreement was that the women attending my meditation class were there by their own choice, meaning that their attendance was not manded by DCSO. I would see an average of 15 to 20 women each week and sometimes as many as 30. Most of the women attending the program had been in jail for less than 90 days and some of them were fresh off the street. 
Most of them had a serious alcohol and or other drug problem. Many of them had symptoms of PTSD, and others had a history of prostitution and had been subjected to life on the streets for many years. The good news was that most of these women really wanted some kind of help, which made things a lot more manageable for me. And one of the reasons it's important that people in the program have some choice whether or not to participate is that the pushback instructors face in mandated programs can be extremely difficult to work through without proper training and working with resistance. It took me a few weeks to get a felt sense of what would be the most useful in terms of cultivating any mindful awareness. One thing I've learned over the years is that it's crucial to set up some type of buy-in to be able to encourage or inspire some sense of possible value for the people in the room. This typically manifests as demystifying the meditative experience. Self-disclosure and transparency about one's own personal struggles is often the most effective strategy. For the first month or so, I had a small group of about 6 to 10 women who were gaining some ability to experience mental calm by employing basic body-breath awareness techniques. Whether it was the mindfulness exercises that were helping, or it was the fact that they were getting out of the hectic environment of the unit for long enough to relax, one never really knows. What began to happen over a short period of time was that the word got around and more women were signing up for the class. Or perhaps their counselors were suggesting or perhaps requiring them to attend. That's when things really started to reveal themselves. I began to notice that the basic mindfulness instructions were not taking hold. The women struggled to drop their attention into feeling and sensation by practicing mindfulness of breathing. What they reported was that the onslaught of thoughts was too much to handle and the content of thoughts had too strong a grip. I attempted to tweak the instructions, shorten the meditations, provide helpful feedback and suggestions, and things just seemed to go nowhere. The women continued to show up for the groups and by all appearances were putting forth the effort, but the forces of the mind still seemed to prevail. I started to question if I was the right person for the job. What started to become clear was that most of the women were struggling with thoughts that were extremely harmful in nature. These women reported being constantly bombarded by overwhelming judgmental and self-critical thoughts of regret, guilt, shame, sadness, anger self-hatred and resentment, a full attack of the unkind mind. Being familiar with these internal forces myself and knowing that sometimes basic mindfulness instructions aren't enough of an arsenal to overcome them, I decided to shift gears and see if heart practice may have a better impact. I started with a simple meta practice designed to overcome fear and allow for an experience of ease rooted in an attitude of kind friendliness. This application doesn't differ greatly from mindfulness, but requires the addition of deliberately forming conceptions by applying simple phrases toward breath awareness. As I was trained by mind-body awareness project instructors, I was familiar with a module they teach to incarcerated youth called basic goodness. The intention is to touch into that quality, the idea that we are inherently good. The process acknowledges that somewhere along the way we became confused angry, or afraid, and we may have lost this sense of basic goodness. Regardless of their particular struggles, people consistently get better when they begin to realize that they have value. If people are able to get in touch with this idea, real transformation begins to take place. I've personally seen this many, many times. I came into the room the following week explaining what we were going to do and asked if everyone was game to switch gears. I always find that it's quite helpful to ask people's permission when you decide to change or alter what has been done previously. It helps build a stronger rapport and it is a very simple way to express empathy and respect. After just a few minutes of mindfulness of breathing, I instructed everyone to place careful attention toward the rise and fall of the breath at the heart center and begin offering a phrase internally. Keeping things simple as possible, I started with the phrases that I found to be the least triggering. May I be at ease, may I be peaceful, and may I be content in this moment, just as it is. Using the hybrid practices of breath awareness and kind friendliness over the course of a few minutes, the energy throughout the entire room began to shift. The women were able to sit still, and there was much less observable restlessness and agitation. 
I kept repeating the phrases over and over, reminding them to return the phrases and or the breath when they noticed that their attention had wandered off. As the room became more and more attuned, several of the women began to tear up, which started a chain reaction throughout the room. I let the room fall into silence for the last few minutes and then rang the bell to end the meditation. The entire session lasted about 25 minutes. Most of the women reported that the phrase allowed them to block out harmful and unkind thoughts. The addition of phrases within the structure of mindfulness of breathing provided just enough content and information to allow the mind to settle. The phrases ultimately have a threefold benefit, helping develop some degree of concentration because the mind has content to work with, allowing one to block out negative or harmful thoughts and cognitive content that may arise, and at times it allowing for a rising of the intended ethical state, in this case, kindness and friendliness. This hybrid mindfulness practice creates the potential for three-pointed concentration. Research around attention and mindfulness has suggested that three-pointed concentration can be extremely helpful for those first learning the practice. It is particularly helpful for those with attention disorders and high anxiety. My experience is that the program greatly shaped how I have continued to teach mindfulness. Actualizing Ethical Mindfulness Obviously, the practice of ethical mindfulness is far more than developing one skill to achieve one goal. It helps if we take a systems view as to how it works. We find a set of ideas that includes theory, application, practice, ethics, and fruition. These work together into a nested hologram of lived experience and we can start developing them at any time. They will have practical and beneficial consequences throughout the entirety of our lives. By embracing the ideas and practices found within early Buddhism and putting the Pali formulas into direct action, we enter into a new way of life. Ethical mindfulness involves the development of three sets of four. Number one, understanding the process of the four noble truths. Number two, practicing the four foundations of mindfulness. And number three, cultivating the four appropriate responses of the heart practices. The Four Noble Truths act as a type of fulcrum that balances mindfulness and ethics, or, in colloquial Buddhist terms, we would say wisdom and compassion. We apply the contextual framework of the Four Noble Truths and consider how they play a significant role in our lives. The term truth here doesn't imply a sense of true versus false, but rather the reality of something that exists, like the truth of gravity. Whether or not we believe it, it's still there. As we develop skill in applying the Four Noble Truths, we start to include the practices of mindfulness and ethics as necessary and appropriate. We develop a wide range of skills to meet the demands of our lives, thus cultivating a sense of confidence and trust that comes from within. We start by turning towards stress and all the ways it plays out in our inner and outer lives. We employ the practices of internal and external mindfulness so that we begin to educate and update ourselves as to how we feel the effects of stress. We acknowledge that stress is a part of life and we become honest about the difficulties in our lives. This chips away all of the denial strategies that have only provided us with short-term relief. We begin to look beyond immediate gratification and are no longer willing to be driven by the pleasure-pain dichotomy hardwired into our human survival instinct. We cultivate kindness and friendliness inward and outward, and begin to learn how to meet and hold stress in a way that is less reactive. In daily practice, we learn to cultivate mindfulness of the breath-body sensations by developing the practices found within the first foundation of mindfulness. Using the basic tools of simple awareness, we learn to ignore the mind and its contents. By putting these skills into practice and learning the tools of self-regulation, we can access and manage stress with greater ease. Next, we learn to see all the ways reactivity creates suffering within our system. We experience how craving, aversion, grasping, clinging, and attachment causes suffering. We begin to explore all the ways we hold tightly to feelings, perceptions, and opinions. We cling to our plans and worries and all our to-do strategies in an attempt to avoid unpleasantness of any kind. We begin to understand that if we are unable to face our stress, we will create suffering around it. 
We see how we attempt to distract ourselves in a variety of ways in a vain attempt to avoid what is happening right here, right now. With careful attention, we can learn to access emotions that we have historically experienced as intolerable and unbearable. We start to use protective awareness as a way to provide an inner sense of safety and refuge. We learn to install this protective awareness at the second foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of feelings. This allows us to track and monitor feeling states as they arise and pass away. We learn to develop an ethical relationship to pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral experiences. We bring compassion, empathy, and forgiveness to those experiences that are unpleasant. We begin to see them as objects that we can relate to, rather than subjective experiences that we need to avoid or capture. When we are experiencing pleasant states, we learn to enjoy and appreciate them without the need to cling to these experiences, attempting to take them hostage, and therefore creating suffering when they naturally pass away. These practices destroy addiction. As we gain more confidence in our ability to perform these first two tasks, we can expand our practice into the third noble truth and third foundation, mindfulness of mind and mindfulness of release. We include all mental states, attitudes, and a wider understanding of emotions. At this point, we will have some emotional intelligence. We will have a broader vocabulary of the emotions we experience. We can see unpleasant emotions in the form of anger, fear, or sadness. We feel into the pleasant states of happiness, joy, and contentment without clinging to them and begin to enjoy those moments with more presence. We experience moments of release and decreasing reactivity. We become able to access the direct experience of overcoming suffering. We may find that these short moments repeated will become sustained and we will develop a much wider gap between stimulus and response. We learn to employ and develop the practice of introspective awareness by knowing the presence and absence of these specific mind states and emotions. We will continue to develop our skills around meeting difficulties with kindness, compassion, and forgiveness and meeting our joy, happiness, and success with enjoyment and appreciation. Finally, we learn to live from a place of equanimity. We continue to develop the full range of ethical mindfulness practices. We include the world of thoughts by developing the entire Eightfold Path. We cultivate internal mindfulness by establishing the appropriate view, understanding, and acknowledging the Four Noble Truths. We embrace stress and meet it with kind friendliness. We abandon craving and reactivity. We learn to respond with compassion and forgiveness toward the full range of unpleasant experiences within our body, emotions, and thoughts. We are able to enjoy and appreciate all the pleasant experiences and successes of our lives without becoming attached to them. We develop and maintain intentions that are rooted in non-harming as we move out into the world. We turn toward external mindfulness in the realms of speech, actions, and livelihood while maintaining skillful views and intentions. We practice non-harming, generosity, and empathy wherever and whenever we can. By doing so, we begin to heal and liberate our mental factors of feelings, perceptions, and volition by relating to and from them skillfully. We turn back into our minds by applying the appropriate effort, mindfulness, and concentration. We continue to become honest about the difficulties in our lives. We undercut and take full responsibility for our unsuccessful denial strategies, and we work to overcome them with effort and willingness. The experience of regret diminishes as we become aware of how and where we are causing it. This allows us to see clearly all the ways we are causing unnecessary suffering for ourselves, and we begin to let go. As we do this, we become more confident. We develop an optimistic attitude as we learn how to release ourselves from the suffering of reactivity and craving. Most importantly, we stay with it and we keep going. As we develop the full range of ethical mindfulness skills, we see that they all grow and expand into a process that serves our deepest intentions for true happiness and well-being. We engage in a process and a way of life that leads us to the end of unnecessary suffering and we see that there is a wide range of skills we need to continue to develop. As our understanding of these skills improve, our willingness to continue to live ethically will grow. The practice of mindfulness allows us to balance these two aspects. 
we find that we can move through our lives with much more ease and presence. We can learn to live well. The End This has been an audio recording of Ethical Mindfulness, written by Dave Smith. Narrated by Graham Dunlop. Edited by Darren Grimes. See Dave's website at davesmithdharma.com.